Let's say you got the funds. Let's say you got the manager, the songs, all that stuff. And now you know, your manager is going to bring a group of customers around and you, you can ask them any questions you want. And those questions are going to help you make better art and make better stuff. What are you going to ask them? Like, what do you want to know? And nine times out of 10, those questions will find their way circulating around like, what is their life like? Where do they participate in music? What do they care about? What are they into? Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hey, rock stars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Brad Dollar, an empowering Grammy-nominated producer and engineer who's been part of over a thousand release titles. He has worked with major artists like g Easy, Bob Weir, or is it g Easy or is it Geezy? How, it's how g Easy. You, you got it right. You got it right. Geezy. All right, cool. Um, slightly stupid, as well as rising talent like Madame Gandhi, um, Davidas, Dovidas, Dovidas. Thank you, Lithuanian. Thank you. Ah, uh, it's cool. It's a cool. I like the way it's spelled too. And catch Pritchard or Pritchard. Pritchard, you got it right. You got it right the first time. Trust right, your trust it. your instinct. That's right. And um, has ultimately been a part of over a thousand released titles. Like I said, Brad has also started Zoo Labs in Oakland, California, or or was a, one of the co-starters of that, um, a nonprofit that accelerates music career development. Zoo Labs' mission, and my interpretation of it, is to empower artists to create music on a self-directed and successful career path, among other things. So I'm looking forward to learning more about some of the cool records that Brad has made and also to better understand the ways that we can create our own music and get it out to the world. As musical entrepreneurs, we want to know what we can do to make our music sustainable, thriving, and fun. So please welcome Brad Dollar to Recording Studio Rock Stars. Brad. Lish, thanks for having me. Are you ready to rock? Dude? I'm so ready to rock. Sweet, man. So before we were going, uh, we were chatting a little bit and you started talking about like, you know, starting out in this and I don't know why the number, the age 12 stuck in my head. Maybe you did or didn't say that, but uh, how did you start out in all this music stuff? Man? I'll really try not to ramble. You can cut me off at any point. I tend to like be long winded. Okay. That's so. good enough, man. Thanks. So. Let's move to the next all right. question. No, just See kidding. Later. Go ahead. No. Um, I mean, like like everybody else um, who falls into music, it kind of shows up in your life early on, inspires you in some way. Uh, for me, it was pretty early. My mom played piano when I was a kid. Uh, I dinkled around on it, uh, played clarinet when I was seven, you know, kind of just tried to get into music, was not good at those things. But I was always trying to write music. I remember like learning that, oh, like these are what notes are. And I would just start putting them on paper. Um, that you, really, you didn't get in trouble for, for dinkling around on the piano? No, no, no dinkling. No, <laughs> dinkling was, uh, was allowed in the dollar household. Uh, my my mom was always like, wash your hands before you play the piano. That was like the big rule, you know? No, that, that piano was like, it was always filthy because <laughs> like everyone would just like play it. Everyone just like come home and like dinkle on it. That's the best word I could think about. Cause like you're just trying notes, putting like things together. So that was always a big thing in my life. Um, I think that's important actually. I mean, I, I actually got for the house with my daughter growing up there, I got an upright piano and it was a free one. Of course we had to rent a truck to get it over there, but just, I remember that too, just having a piano there when you're growing up and then it's like this puzzle every once in a while. And then somebody shows you a song and then you're over there trying to figure it out and messing around. And sure enough, that's what she does too. So it's just kind of like it infiltrates your life. Um, by 12, that age you said, um, that's when I like took everything a little more seriously. Music wise, I started playing guitar uh, convinced my mom that that was what I want to do. I saw on uh, the the MTV Video Music Awards it was uh, it was Kid Rock and Run DMC and Aerosmith, like uh, Joe Perry from Aerosmith. And I was like, wow, that's like all my favorite stuff in one thing. Like I I gotta I gotta do it. So went down. Where get, were you growing up? Uh, grew up in uh, the Bay Area, Oakland, California. Outside Oakland, California, super specifically uh, San Pablo and and Pinole, California. Okay. Uh, grandma's house was in San Pablo. You know, went there before and after school. School's in Pinole, so. Um, Sorry for dumb questions, but Oakland, no, California is it's San totally Francisco. Cool. I, I, area, I forget right? that everyone's not a uh, geography major. Uh, yeah. So, so to um, the rest of us, there's two cities in California. <laughs> there's San Francisco and Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's exactly, exactly. So uh, the, the San Francisco Bay area is all the cities that surrounds like the San Francisco area. San Francisco itself is very small. It's like seven miles by seven miles. 
And so the bigger Bay Area is all the communities that literally surround it. So I kind of grew up towards like the the north uh, slash East Bay kind of side of things. You guys um, are all just stare out your window and see Alcatraz in the distance. Is that how it works? Uh, n- Depends on where you're at. No, no. Usually you're staring out and depending where you're at, you're either seeing rolling hills and a beautiful sunset or a yeah, refinery. Right. It just kind of depends where you're at. Nice. Um, so uh, Panola and San Pablo are like uh, 30 minutes outside San Francisco. Um, you know, so that that's kind of where I grew up. Played played music in Oakland my whole life. Um, just jumping back into like the guitar thing. As soon as I had a guitar and I could convince myself that I could like write songs, I found people to start playing music with. Uh, found my friend Chris Sanchez. Uh, he lives in Seattle now. Um, we just started writing songs. We had a band called uh, Society's Edge. Nice. <laughs> and uh, and we would like book shows. We would like, um, he had really supportive parents. I had really supportive parents, uh, supportive mom. And, uh, you know, they let us, you know, they drive us to the shows, unload it for us, you know, help, you know, help us get going. And we just would like get on the phone and book shows. We would get on the phone and like call studios and let us try to let them try to let us come in there and make music. And just really spent that whole like high school life, like, playing shows, put like really recording music, playing shows, recording music. And, and I really fell into that recording music side of things. It's really been the thing I loved, especially like as I got older and my friends started taking their musicianship more seriously. I was like, they're really good. And I was like, I'm oh, not that great, but I was nailing this like recording side of things. And everyone was reaching out to me. I was the one who was putting money into recording gear. I built a small studio in my grandma's house and, you know, ran a snake from like her, her kitchen to like the, you know, the, the garage. It was on the other side of the property. Just all kinds of crazy stuff like that. And how, how do you remember even being aware at that young age that studio was a thing, that, that studios existed and therefore you might want one? Because I, I had ideas I wanted to, bef- I had ideas and I knew I wanted to like put them on something. And then when I learned what the word record meant, that was like, that was everything. And um, kind of like synonymous with, uh, with falling into recording, I fell into like guitar playing. So I was really curious, like, how were they getting those sounds? Like, it's hard to, I guess you can think about anything you start learning now in your life. You're like, you're so blown away by all the facets of it. Well, like I was really blown away by all the facets of, facets of guitar playing, you know, the, the sounds, like what mics they use is really into Metallica. So they're like a superhero recording band. So yeah. I started studying that and like, what, what does that mean? And that, and it was just one thing after the other. It was it's like, like if I watch a, a movie and then one day it occurs to me, like, how did they make that? shot there and then you start learning exactly. about it and discover that there's the whole art of cinematography. Now I try to leave some of those things mysterious. Um a few of my friends are into like uh like projection mapping and all that kind of stuff. And like like if I study this I could probably get it. I don't want to know. I I like being like wild. So I would but, say that is that, projection mapping the same thing as my friends who do dome projections or is that something different? No, I think it's the same thing. I mean, like now it's evolved to like where like they'll have multiple objects that are being projected on from the same thing. Oh, that's and, like stage lighting. I, the, yeah. Like Beck's show that I yeah, saw. Yeah, it's like, like connect that. to an Ableton rig and they're playing tracks back and it's sync with the oh, music. Now I want to learn about that. This, this Why'd you really have to cool. bring it up? <laughs> I know. I know. It's, uh, there's a couple places in town that, um, that do that. Um, uh, Anthony Falcone is a local artist here in Nashville. Uh, who's kind of kind of starting to bring some of that around. Um, right. Did I meet him when I met you? Is he the one who's just opened up a shop here in East Nashville? He's over at home. He's, okay. He's, oh, at home. Okay, yeah, great. He's great. the producer engineer at home. Um, yeah, well, great, we'll come back. Artist. We'll circle back to that, too. Sure, I want to learn sure. more about that, too. Because like you said, uh, home here in East Nashville is, a, you know, basically a um, – What's what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, uh, an incubator, like a music incubator, in the same way that Zoo Labs is. Out in, it's very you know, similar, Oakland, right? All right, cool. We'll come. We'll come back to that. Sweet. Right, we got plenty of time. All right, so dig it. So you start getting into the recording stuff yourself. Did you then go straight to like a, a pro studio and like during your high school time, or mm-hmm. was it afterwards? No, no. Like uh, as soon as we had some songs, um, I would say by the time I was 13 or 14, uh, we started going to you know, um, they were pro to us, you know, like, uh, they had separate control rooms and studios. The first place, first place was much credit to, uh, Alan Aller. Um, he had this place called dog bark studios in Pinole. And Alan is actually the half brother of Billy Joe Armstrong from green day. Okay. So this first studio that we walk in to, to record at, like there's a gold dookie record, like that his brother had given him and like the red, like cheap squire guitar that he had recorded dookie with in the room. That's so cool. like, that was like, I was like, oh, this is it. Like, I'm even getting chills thinking about it. Like, this is like why we're doing it, you know? So right away I got into that, um, went to this other place a little, a couple years later, as we would do it, we'd be like, we'd realize the sounds we actually wanted. We realized like, oh, like, you know, like that doesn't sound very good. We should do it like this, or we got to play better. The biggest part was like, we got to play better. So we'd always want to like perfect and then go record again. 
um, Pop Smear Studios, which is in San Rafael, California. This guy, Scott Lamas, he basically recorded like every local Bay Area band for the longest time that was up and coming. If you were like, if you wanted to sound pro, but you were like a teenager, he would record you. He had like this awesome deal. It was like 300 bucks for a full day of recording. He would definitely get you four songs and you would leave with four songs like done. And who is that? Scott Lamas. Scott Lamas. I think like, okay, cool. like Lamas plural, but like Lamas, uh, pop smear studios. Um, a few artists came out of that, um, that have, uh, kind of like risen to success. My favorite is someone, I think everything he touches turns to gold. Um, Ricky Reed, his name is Eric Frederick. Uh, he was in a band called, uh, Locale I am at the time that became a band called facing New York. That became a band called wallpaper. And now this guy's in LA as a studio producer. He works on like all those making trainer songs. I think he did a song on the new Travis Scott record. All right, I'm not right. sure. So, you know, kind of like I've always been drawn to like those like epicenters of like people, you know, spouting out of them and, yeah. and doing that. So, so yeah. So high school was a lot of like getting around to the studios and trying to make some music and put it out. Most and, and you were really into um, like uh, pop punk kind of bands and stuff that would yeah. have um, on the um, and metal. Yeah, and metal. All right, all right. Yeah, um, what's the, the uh, what's the tour that I'm thinking of that uh, where all the skate punk bands would play? Vans Warped Tour. Yeah, Vans Warped Tour. That you would know, have been your world, or not? Well, what's funny is Vans Warped Tour came for me a little later. So, kind of the end of my high school, uh, beginning of like my like um, post high school life. I started a ska punk band, and I kind of got deeper, got a, more away from like the hard rock and metal, and more into like the the punk rock element of things. And so I really started doing the warp Tour thing on, my, on like the, like 16 to like 19 is when I did that. So, but to answer your question, uh, the summer sanitarium tour, Metallica used to go around with like, you know, uh, whatever the new metal bands were of the day of the moment. I think the last one I saw was like, uh, Metallica, Limp Bizkit, Mudvayne, Linkin Park. And, uh, I think, uh, and the Deftones, like on one bill. Oh, cool. Yeah. It was, it was pretty sweet for like being 15 years old. It was, Awesome. And did you go from high school and then sort of like do the college thing and keep your band stuff going? Or did you go straight into out of high school is like, I'm doing the music thing? That's a really good question. Uh, I took a year. I knew I knew in senior year of high school when all my friends were applying to like all these colleges and they're doing their essays. I was like, I know this isn't for me. Um, I went to this college called Expression College for Digital Arts. It's in Emeryville, California. Uh, I ended up getting a Bachelor's of Applied Science and Audio Engineering from there. So I knew it existed. I went on a tour of it with my mom and, you know, when I was 11 in 11th grade and I was like, I knew that was it. I knew I was going there. So, um, I actually just kind of like focused on music senior year. And then that year after took it, took it off, played a lot of music. I thought I was going to, uh, I thought I was going to like have the, the two worlds of like, I'm a performer, you know, artist. I'm also going to become a studio guy. And it became more and more about the, the, the studio side of it. So took that year off and then went right to expression and, and, um, you know, like I was playing music, was playing shows, I was recording. Um, but like by the end of school, it was kind of like phased out of like being in a band, Right. you know, it was kind of like everyone had split off. Like one of my friends who was in the band, Devin, he became a big uh, graphic designer. Other friend, Andy, I told you about early, earlier, Andy Wilkie, uh, you know, became like a music educator. Um, so people kind of like split off and did their own thing. And by the time we were in our you know early twenties, it's like, oh man, it's time to pay the rent. Right. You know, it's like, well, I'm going to lean on this thing that I've like been dedicated myself to at that point, you know, almost 10 years. Yeah. You get to a point maybe where you're like, um, you know, you've been living and thinking that this is the hustle with the payoff on, uh, you know, at the end of all this hard work. And then one day you're like, Oh wait, no, this is the success. This mm -hmm. is the, it does. We just continue hustling. Right. Right. The game, the game doesn't get easier just cause you get deeper into it. It just like, it's just, it's, I missed her analogy and I just, it's like, it's, it's the video game thing. It's like every level is a little bit harder for a reason. Right. You Interesting. Know? And yeah. you wouldn't play the game if it was always the same level over and over again. Like, you know, Tetris gets kind of boring. It's true. I get sick of those games, like where it keeps, it kicks you back to the the beginning every time yes. you die and you have to start all over and, you're, and then I'm you, just like, oh, you just lost all your Fortnite fans. Yeah. All right. So um, I like to ask <laughs> guests to start out the podcast, uh, kicks off with an inspirational we start? quote. We've already started. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, we're rolling, <laughs> rolling, rolling right along. But, um, right. you know, you got anything that you want to uh, inspire us with? Any any cool quote to uh, hit the studio? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think about this. Um, I think about this quote all the time because I think it's the most uh, the most relevant thing as we all have like these hard drives full of stuff and we're trying to be decisive and we're like, should we just like not put it out? But uh, John Cutler, when I started working for Bob Weir, The Grateful Dead, oh, yeah. uh, John Cutler was my first like 
boss. Like he was, uh, he was the Grateful Dead's producer and engineer on In the Dark, like their first like platinum record. He was with them touring, uh, doing like doing all the live uh, recording in the truck that they were doing uh, in the seventies. So he was like the recording guy. I got very lucky to have him as like as a mentor. Um, and what was his name again? John Cutler. John Cutler. Uh, and that quote was Re- record more than you erase. And yeah, I, I, I love that, it. Yeah. that always stuck with me because I feel like um, there's just this this idea that you you have to like get it right the first time or somehow like your perspective right then that moment is is it. And sometimes it's not. And I think that when you just let a lot of that stuff come out, the gold really comes. And I don't even necessarily mean like uh, inside of one song for, for me, maybe, maybe that's true. But for me, I really feel like it's about like making a lot of music. Yeah. Um, I tend to like think about um, producing engineering in terms of like the song itself and, and, uh, creating stuff that touches people, but that's not something you're going to do every time. You kind of like have to, you got to create the 100 to get the one. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah you don't need to like get one perfect song. I mean, I, my analogy was going to be 10 to one, but mm-hmm. you're probably more realistic on the hundred to one. It was like, you know, don't try and get one song just perfectly right. Like get 10 songs out there and be right. really surprised at which one turns out to be awesome. You know? Yeah. You don't know. And it's the same thing with like Grateful Dead. Like they didn't know what shows were going to be good. The whole reason Grateful Dead is magical to people is because you don't know what you're going to get. And people are like, Oh, May 5th, 1977, in this place, or, you know, August 6th. Like it's because like there's certain solos and certain parts of the songs that never happened. Otherwise or people like, they sync together that they otherwise wouldn't. And like, that only happens if they record it. And if they don't, you don't capture it, no one ever knows. And yeah. You know. you think the Grateful Dead actually listened to the recordings of all their shows? I don't think they did. I don't think you could. I don't think they could, man. It's hard to listen to the podcast that I create every week. So I can't imagine those guys were playing shows every night. Play- I mean- and they recorded everything. Like the the first recording trucks that ever existed were Grateful Dead trucks. And they were basically like, you know, it was a tape machine. And then they would have the mics wired to like a rack of transformers that were perfectly uh wound to that mic's impedance there weren't any preamps it was just wow. like mic transformer thing super clean redundant systems this is like this is like mid to early mid to late 70s you know and what was the they, they had something called the wall of sound was that yeah it? they had the wall of sound and I remember, that, and, that was and, an and interesting concept they were basically trying to have like a giant like three-way system right like you know all the bass would come out of these speakers the drums would come out of these speakers the vocals would come out of these and yeah. they were calibrated and tuned and i obviously i didn't hear it but i, I apparently it's amazing there are a lot of little chunks of it around at bob weir's place like at, at uh, tri studios which is where i ended up working yeah for him for a few years and uh you know they would be like oh like that speakers like that was on jerry's side of the wall of the wall you know or like oh that's one of phil's like bass speakers and you see in the picture like oh it is it you know. That's great. That's good. That, so I have this um, bumper sticker that's stuck in my head and it keeps coming up every time I'm thinking about stuff. And it's um, from the 80s. It was like, um, great bass, lesh filling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a little oh. spin on the light beer ad, you know, but it was for Phil lesh, lesh filling. There's a, there's a lot of funny ones. I saw one because um, there's all these road cases around. Um, there's one, um, uh, Bobby is an Indian or like, or... Um, Oh, I forget, like, you know, or like Bobby's a cowboy too. I don't know. Like, like silly, like, I have no idea what that even means. Just like weird jokes like that. They all, they all had. Um, so that's a trip, man. And, and, uh, you know, tell us about, I guess let's just jump right in, man. Tell us about working with Bob Weir. So it's pretty cool that you got to work with him. Um, I would be thrilled to work with anybody from the Grateful Dead, you know? I got, I got lucky. And I think that if there's anything anyone can ever take away from like my life and like think about, it's kind of just being prepared for the opportunity. Uh, you could call it right place, right time, but I don't think that's enough. I think we're always in the right place at the right time. I think it's more about like what you do with your time there. Yeah. Uh, uh, at do you the, take advantage of the opportunities that are handed to you? Yes. And and be ready to, to deliver on them. Um, that's actually why I love living in Nashville. I feel like everyone here is like really ready for those opportunities. And then when they show up, they they give it, they give it all. Um yeah, with, with with Bob, it was interesting. So when I was uh, 19, I started working for this guy, uh, Stephen Hart, really uh, my first mentor, my first like, like music Any boss. relation to Mickey? No, no relation to Mickey, which is interesting, but I'll come back to that. And uh, Stephen worked on like uh, early White Stripe stuff. He, he did Watt Stacks. He remixed that. Um, he worked at Fantasy Studios in Berkeley, California, which is actually going to close next month. Uh, he was a chief mm-hmm. engineer there for a long time. Just awesome producer engineer. He opened a space at this place called Bay Area Sound Studios in San Rafael. And it was like basically um, very similar to your studio, Lish. Uh, it was like control rooms, uh, studio space inside of a bigger complex. It was a bigger rehearsal facility that this guy, Michael LaValle, owned. 
Um, and the day it opened, um, Stephen um, called me up. Well, okay. I went to a Grammy uh, Grammy event uh, in San Francisco when I was like a Grammy U member. I met him. Like I was very, like went up to him, shook his hand. I was like, I would love to talk to you more. I was very persistent. I texted him, I called him. And he eventually like invited me over to the studio and I just came and he like had me start setting up some PAs and recording some stuff with him. And we just, we gelled. And if, and he saw that I was like, you know, somewhat competent and that kind of became a job for me at that studio. So I worked at Bay Area Sound Studios, uh, for two or three, two years. And then it became defunct, uh, right around the 2008 crisis, uh, 2009, uh, the studio's bottom kind of fell out. And so the, the property went up for sale. And at the time, Bob Weir was getting ready to build a studio. He actually used to own the space that was called Kerner Optical in San Rafael. And Kerner Optical is where they shot the scenes, uh, all the, uh, the the little scenes for like Indiana Jones. They did some of like the Death Star trench run shots there. Wow. Um, so it was this old like, you know, Lucasfilm office that he used to have. So he was trying to move out of that warehouse and into this into the space. And um, I was, uh, you know, managing the studio by that point in terms, I was helping Steven and also managing the studio, um, kind of in terms of what I was doing. And I was at the front desk, uh, it was super, super empty. And I, I'd met John Cutler. He'd come in once before with Michael Lavalley. And then here came John again. And I knew that John was with Grateful Dead, but I didn't know anything about the Grateful Dead. Right. You were coming from this, uh, the Vans Warp tour back then. Yeah. Around. I was like, good, cool. Like much respect, but like, I didn't know the songs. I didn't know anything about that. I think I knew like Touch of Grey, you know, all that kind of stuff. Because the video. So, like, you had a record called Hate Ashbury. I know that's a street corner in San Francisco. <laughs> Luckily I was a little, a slightly, slightly more informed, but I wouldn't have let on like that. Um, actually the first thing I said to Bob was, Hey, nice beard, man. His beard looked great. <laughs> I was like so impressed. Uh, I didn't have a beard at the time. And um, wait a minute, do they have a record called Eight Ashbury? No, they don't think they do. <laughs> they don't do. They, just, don't they, they got, got, they, got a, they got a house there. They got a house there. Um, so um, yeah, I just kind of fell into it. Uh, Cutler ended up hiring me for that gig with Bob because I was a not a fan of the Grateful Dead. I didn't smoke weed yet. Right. Imagine how many people they have that would that are not going to be able to help at all who just want to be there, like. Dude, he, I mean, like, fans. that was like the prerequisite I found out later on, like, as we would bring on people to the staff is like, the less you knew about the Grateful Dead, the more likely you were to hire. So, um, so they, what they were doing is they, they start out, they're just going to build a recording studio. And then it became that they wanted to build this like live streaming, live webcasting place. And this is before Facebook live. So now it's like, oh, just pull out your phone and do that. Like that didn't exist yet. That was yeah. only a few years ago and it didn't exist. So to do that, you had to have the cameras and the streaming server. And like, they went to town, they, they put in, um, an API vision in that, in that studio. Um, well, just to back up. So they bought, they bought Barrier Sound Studios. And then I was part of like the transition to get it up to speed to be a studio. It had all these different rooms that were rehearsal spaces, but you know, they wanted certain rooms to be like the, the main studios, certain rooms to be like the control room. This room was going to be, you know, the ISO and the, you know, Bob's guitar shed and all these kinds of things. So, um, I was a big part of my first kind of run was helping get the studio up and running. Um, you know, it was there for the construction. I have a lot of great photos of like the walls being torn down and then putting stuff up. I learned a lot. I know you like studio, studio construction. I learned yeah. a lot just from being around that and seeing like how these people put all this stuff in. It's pretty cool. I mean, you know, when you don't know it, it's pretty amazing to learn all this, these elements that make a studio work. And then even to learn the stuff that like doesn't really matter that you thought yeah. mattered, you know? Yeah. All that stuff. Um, yeah. And then, uh, we, we built the studio out, um, put that beautiful console in, um, just, it was like the, at the time, the first API vision, you know, West of the Mississippi, the only What ones. is an API vision? Uh, the API vision is a big 48 channel analog desk. That's got, uh, you know, great automation that works with pro tools. It's got all those gorgeous API preamps, uh, 500 yeah. series pre's, um, amazing headroom. I mean, like it, you could just slam that console and to get it to, it like, would never break up. It would just be gorgeous the whole time. And so what we did with that, we, we did a lot of recordings. We did a lot I've of like, live broadcasts. Dead, uh, drum solos. <laughs> oh, they, no. they hit the big drums hard. Yeah. We, uh, we mixed a lot of Grateful Dead re-releases on that. I have some Grateful Dead credits, strangely, because we did a lot of these like re-releases and remixing and stuff like that. Um, but that desk was critical next. We could do these live streams and we could also do 5-1 mixing. And uh, we were also recording to tape. We had like two Studer AA20s um, that we would like record to. We had the clasp system. Do you remember oh, yeah. that thing? I remember clasp. Yeah. yeah. We had one of those, uh, Chris Estes was a big early supporter of TRI. Um, so it was, it was a super powerful hybrid. And that was my, my biggest takeaway from that place is that we were, we were doing the digital analog thing like really well and putting out video with it. We were, we were creating stuff and releasing stuff. And that's also been a constant in my life is always kind of making music that's got some 
got some distribution built around it. You know, even if it's just like this band's got an awesome local fan base and they're going to work these songs to them. Like that's really important. I love that about TRI that, you know, there was fans, there's people watching. We could put up a live stream and, you know, people would tune in and everything. So. And is that where I saw some of the videos with, um, Bob was sort of like teaming up with some other bands and covering dead songs or. Yeah, that was, that was the big thrust of it is like, you know, Bob called it his playground. He, he made a couple records there. Um, he hasn't made a lot. Um, the newest one, Blue Mountain, uh, that a lot of that was done there. Um, he's done some one-off songs, but a lot of it's been those live recordings, those live collaborations, uh, slightly stupid. I think is one of the ones yeah. I showed you. We did yeah. that a couple times actually. And the, the, the one I sent you is the one we did, uh, just, uh, most recently, um, and, cool. and that, that was great. Uh, we and then Rockstar's a reminder, of course, I've got that in a YouTube playlist for you. So if you just go in the show notes, oh, yeah. um, you'll, you'll be able to go yeah, check that. it out. I, the cool thing about those, those recordings are that they are, um, there's not any remixing that went back on that. You know, we spent, um, for every time we would do a session like that, we would spend that, that whole, like a whole day before the session, like a whole day setting up with like no, no music making. And the day before the session, just dialing the stuff in, dialing in the compressors, like getting the mix ready, being ready to do moves and getting like delays and everything ready to go. And then doing the show and have it be like the finished thing. And so what you hear is like the output of like an API vision straight to like, you know, a 96K converter, like right to the web. And like, this sounds, sounds good. It sounds fat. It's very interesting. It's, it's polished where it should be and raw where it should be. And um, yeah, I, I love a lot of those recordings. Uh, I think that, um, I think Bob's pulled back from the TRI studios video thing now. Uh, so it might be kind of hard to find that stuff, but that slightly stupid link is up and you should you check it out. They're a great band, by the way. Again, an, another band I had no idea that I would like, uh, uh, like being around, let alone liking working with. So yeah, that's cool, man. That's yeah. cool. All right. Well, um, you know, uh, I also like to share, ask guests to share kind of an important failure story. You know, something that maybe became a great learning experience for you along the way. Mm. Uh, I, I embrace failure. There's a great uh, Adam Savage um, YouTube thing from a long time ago. He talks about failure. It's like a thing he did for the Maker's Fair. The guy from Mythbusters. Yeah. Um, I embrace failure. I think that it's hard, it's actually kind of hard for me to think about like where things have fallen apart because I always see like the way they put, they come back together. But the biggest thing for me is always like having like value in myself and and really like having others perceive that enough to show it back. Um, to be more specific, I feel like especially with music, um, I always go beyond the call. I always like take on projects. You know, I take on a lot of spec work for people and try to help artists like get over the hump, you know, it's, I get, um, I get a little disheartened, uh, and this is like, so like self-sabotaging, but I get disheartened by, you know, it costs a lot of money to make a record, but yeah, we get, the artists have to make the records to get out in the world. And so, but our, our record economy is like music economy is like not making them a lot of money. So like, how do I help them? So I always like lean on like, well, I'll show them more value. And, and so I think the the biggest failure I've, I've always like tried to like move around and not stumble on is, uh, just being really clear what I think. I'm bringing to something and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if I'm not getting it, asking for it. So communication, it's very easy to roll with the punches and then it can be very taxing after a while. And I've seen that. Mm. I've seen a lot of, uh, it's, it's just kind of indicative of like being a producer engineer in this era is like you do a lot um, on your own dime at first for the hopes of that, that one session, that one thing that's going to, going to kick off. And um, yeah, I think that, I think that having, having a sense of like the value you want for yourself is the, the, the biggest like thing I've tried to like learn. Yeah. From. I think that's important. I, I do that for myself too, self-defining what my takeaway value is on something, because then it can make it a lot easier to accept that the thing, this particular effort you put into something isn't this thing over here on the left and it's might never be, but you don't, mm. that doesn't matter now because you've already defined that, you know, like what, what's happening for you over here on the right is where it's valuable. Like just a random example, but this weekend I was recording music with all my friends and, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement about doing this project together and stuff, but it's a, it's a, you know, just doing something with friends on a certain level. So, I don't have um, I don't have a perspective. I don't think about it in the same way that I would have been thinking about, you know, uh, um, a professional artist coming in and trying to do a record and finish it and follow through and go out and do all this, you know, career building stuff on it. And I'm, but for me, the thing that was really my defining value was I get to play guitar all weekend. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I'm not. I I didn't even. It doesn't matter to me whether this is 
the best take, the worst take, a keeper right. or not a keeper. Let's not talk about it. Let's go do another take because that just means I get to play more guitar. Right. You know? And I think that's, Stuff and, that's like that. and that's the easy failure point, right? Because if you're if if you're truly gonna do this with your life, you have to have that all the time. And that's the thing you have to be like, uh it's it's kind of like when you're on a diet, like you love sugar, but you just like you know you need to take a break. It's right. like you have to be like, I love you, sugar. I I I love you, music, but I just I can't take you on. I don't want to self-sabotage myself by taking on more of you. Right. You know, um, because you your your life will always adapt to what you bring into it, but that's not always a good thing for like what your 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 life's path actually is. And so Right. In yeah. other words, we're we're very capable of um evolving and and like flexing to work with whatever's going on, but that's not always the best choice. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's better to like, um, you know, do a little bit of that, but then be real self-aware about what you want to do with your career and your career path. And, and then sort of like define some boundaries for yourself. Is that mm -hmm. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think just being aware of, of what you want and also being aware of where you give too much of yourself. Right. That's easy to do, especially I think for, for us, you know, we're people who start out with an interest in music and then we, um, evolve over towards the recording studio, which by definition is a service uh, that is delivered to the people who are making the record mm -hmm, and the music mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so we we grow our career abilities around helping other people realize their musical dreams, mm -hmm. right? And that's a great thing and it's a great service, but you're right, there, there comes a time where you're like, if you do that and just to fit in, you're always sort of giving everything away for free and always just sort of like rolling with the punches, like you said, then um, eventually you're just, you know, the you won't have any, your cup won't even be half full. It'll just be empty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It'll just, it'll just be empty. And I think that there's like a, there's a job element to, to be in the music industry that you can, um, you can run with and, and embrace. And that's your, and that's your life. And you turn it off at the end of the day. Um, but for myself, for, for you, for, for most people who are trying to really do this their whole life, it doesn't turn off. Like when I leave the studio, I don't stop having ideas about music. You know, when I lay in bed, I don't stop thinking about the next day. Like when I'm on vacation with my wife, like I don't stop thinking like, man, that'd be awesome for the studio or like, oh, that'd be really great. That's a nice technique. I should come back out in like the woods and do that. Like I, that never stops. And I think just being aware of like when that's happening for you and when you give it to people. Um, also a, a mentor of mine, um, uh, Linda Yavin, she's like a, like a strengths coach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she said recently, like sometimes like you have to just dial back your excitement about how profound things are. Music naturally makes you realize how profound and connected things are and how connected you are to them. Yeah. But the world doesn't always see things like that. So you just kind of have to like keep that dialed, dialed back. It doesn't always have to be at 10. Right. Even if you want it to be at 10 because it feels good, you kind of got to keep it dialed back. And Let's dive into some questions about some of the records you've done too. Um, SOL Development was one of the projects. Soul you Development. Soul Development, yeah. yeah. Helicopter. Um, and I picked up on... You know, I like to flip through and just when I hear something cool, I'm like, oh, we should talk about that. The vocals have a really cool distortion to it. It's a, it's like a, it's rap, but it's also, you know, um, got musical hooks in it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about some of the cool ways that you like to treat vocals. What are some cool things that we can do to have fun? You know, it's, it can get boring sometimes if you're just like, I should just have a high quality mic and a careful compression and mm. the perfect EQ. And that's my vocal. You know, it's a lot more fun when you're like, now let's just put it through a distortion. Right, right. Think about vocals, whatever is like the, the sound or the artist that the, the song is closest to. I just wanted like if it's if it's a hip hop track and we're thinking about like, you know, J. Cole or like or Kanye, like that kind of vocal sound. I want to do something slightly different than that. Right. Like I want, I want to start from the baseline of like what that is and then do something just slightly to the left. You can't reinvent the wheel every time with any sound, whether it's vocals or guitar. You got to give something, pe something to people that they're going to latch onto. It's and you also can't familiar. be afraid. You can't go in fearfully like, right. oh my God, I'm, I'm afraid it's going to sound like this. Right. And the distortion thing doesn't always work or the, like, the, the delay thing doesn't always work. Like there's a time and a place. And I think part of it is trying to listen to the song itself and the space that's actually there. And then she try something that you think wouldn't fit and then bring that in. Um, so like on that Soul Development song, because a lot of hip hop vocals are so like right here in your face, like it's more of a roomy sound. He's kind of in the room a little more. He's not on the mic. He's all, Kriga is also a very like loud, like vocalist. So like, you know, you get some of that room ambience. 
And also the song is, um, you know, it's about like police brutality. And so like having the distortion is like, is very fitting to the right, song. Yeah. It's megaphone ish. Yeah. 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 Good point. All right. Well, so, so what are some cool ways to put distortion on a voice? Oh, so many ways. Um, if you can think about it early enough, uh, I love it from the preamp. I, to what you said a minute ago, it's nice to have that careful sound. It feels really good. You're like, Oh, I got it right. And it also is a little scary when you distort stuff on the way and you're like, Oh, that's distorted. But at the same time, like that kind of becomes like the character the person is singing into or they're performing into. So with distortion, if you can start at the mic pre, it's great. And I don't even care what the mic pre is. It could be Neve, could be a Behringer. It doesn't matter. But in that case, the artist who's doing the vocal is actually hearing their voice with the distortion on it and they're performing it based on that sound. Right, right, right. And if you don't have that flexibility, if the artist is, you know, ne- the artist, you know, is in need of a very clean sound to hear themselves. Um, you know, then you get the post-processing land, you know, I, I, of course, like everybody, I'm a big fan of Decapitator. Um, I think it's great. I have noticed there's a big mid-range notch up like boost in that thing that I'm always cutting out. So I've kind of gravitated towards things any, like any tips on where that is. If oh man, I, I swear. It's like, it's like right where you want the vocals to pop. It's like in the 600 to like one and a half K range. I always dip that a little bit on like whatever, like is whatever that track is like after it, or if it's a bus. Um, but I've kind of leaned on the Fab Filter Saturn stuff recently, and then um, also the the Slate Digital. Um, there's a few plugins in there, like the Bomber. I like that a lot. Um, I think that uh, the saturation stuff sounds really good when it's like uh, a bunch of little saturation on a few different things. I like that a lot. Um, I produce and uh, write in Ableton a lot, and the saturator in that, it just sounds great. So when you say on a few different things, you mean... As opposed to just one thing distorted, or as opposed to not putting distortion on everything in the exactly movie, right? kind of kind of both. Like you know, if you if you wanted that, like that cage the elephant sound, right? Is uh, to me, it's not just like about having one screaming distortion vocal. It's about like oh, there's a little bit of crispiness on the drum. There's some crispiness on the vocal, and like the guitars right. kind of have that. And so just kind of thinking about like the 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 color you're trying to paint into it. Um, and then on the flip side, if that's just like a, a splash of flavor that comes to a very clean track. And I think that doing it as extreme as possible and dialing it back from there is like the way to go. I think that we're not, we're too careful a lot. Right. Yeah. We can be a little more extreme. Are, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, the fun stuff is the stuff where you, you know, kind of let it, let it go. Um, one of the tracks we did this weekend, you know, I had this super distorted guitar and I, and when I went to do the rough mix, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to mess with it. I'm not going to try and mix it right now. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to, wherever we left off, I'm going to see if that, how that feels. And sure enough, later I come back and it's like, oh, that feels great. Did and you, I just said that on the last podcast, too. <laughs> that's awesome. Double plug. Did you, um, was it a distortion sound you were super excited about? Oh, yeah. I was excited about it. It wasn't a vocal. It was a guitar, but it was oh, okay. it was just straight up on the amp. It was just- um, Which is hard, too. It was just thick and, and gritty and like, you know, at risk of being murky or muddy. Like, it would have been easy for me to pick it apart when I was doing the mm. mix. Or pull it back or be careful and be like, it's too loud. Pull it back, you know, don't let volume, it be so loud. The volume is huge. And I don't think that we lean on that enough because it's kind of like, it's not, uh, it's not as sexy just to like move the volume up and down. It's kind of like, oh, that's it, you know? Um, so, but I, I think in terms of like guitars, like what you're saying, like they, they sound different alone than they do with the track, you know? Yeah. You, you add stuff to a, 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 a solo lone guitar. That's like, you wouldn't put in a track, all this like extra top end and low end you put in, like, you don't need that. Well, and there's also a difference in a guitar where you you reel it back into the mix because you're like, oh, I don't want it to be too loud. But then you compress it so that you can bring up the perceived loudness of it. That's a very different guitar sound than if you leave it alone mm-hmm. and you just set it really loud in the track. It's almost like there's more, the, the, the haze and fog of the guitar isn't quite as thick that way. And so therefore you can have it louder but still like perceive the drums and the vocals through mm-hmm. it and it's a cool sound that way you know mm-hmm. absolutely yeah that that relationship like sometimes it comes together quickly and sometimes it has to just be like massaged into place and moving other things out of place too like moving snare drums in and out of place and moving like you know toms in and out of place like there's a um, uh, again kind of going back to my early mentors like i had a, I, I got a nice chance and i'm sure there's guys who are you know my age i'm 30 who are automating you know analog mixes right now but i've 
I, I don't see that a lot. And so I got lucky to see a lot of analog mixes like the faders that were, you know, automated on SSLs and Neves. Yeah. And you would see the moves, like, you know, like they're like lots of micro moves. And so you get to see what's happening. That's yes. true. It's easier to see it then, almost than it is to try and visually look at a Pro Tools screen and understand what was going on. Yeah. I, I've seen a million like icons, like, you know, moving, you know, like faders around and stuff like that. But like when you just, you just watched like a, like a analog console playback automation, you really get a sense of like, oh, they pulled this out there. This, this comes forward here. Um, and you see how bold, how m big a move was to do it, or how many little moves there were. How something. bold. I'm going to drop, uh, I hope it's not a secret, but I'm just going to drop it. My friend Peter Laberton, he's a great, uh, just straight recording engineer and drummer. Um, he's so focused on engineering. He's great at it. He lives in LA now. Um, and uh, he does a lot of sessions. He kind of, he's like the first call guy in the Bay Area for like assisting the big engineers that come that come through. Um, so uh, I guess Ciccarelli was doing a session at 25th Street recording in Oakland. And Peter was the assistant and his like big, I was like, what's, what was your big takeaway? He was like, the biggest thing is like, these guys add way more EQ and way more like volume than you would even think. Like everything is just dimed. Like when the sounds are already good and, and like they, they're engineered well and they're mic'd well and they're done in a great studio, like you can get away with like boosting and cutting a ton of shit. Hmm. And so, you know, everything is just good cranked. Like some things are just like have, you know, on the API vision that's also at 25th street, you know, like, you know, plus nine of like whatever, you know? Well, I think sometimes I always like to bring it back to guitar analogies because with guitar, you see a gain knob on an amp for distortion or a gain knob on a pedal. And it's it's somehow clear that that knob is meant to be turned all the way to the left or all the way to the right if you want to. It's whatever mm -hmm. wherever you want to put it. You know, it's like this expression. It's a whole different sound. And so, like, you can get comfortable with the idea of dialing in guitar sounds that are extreme or that are mild or that are somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And, you know, wherever it feels good is is right. Um, but then somehow we switch to the studio and then we think, like, well, I'm supposed to put on a white lab coat now. Sorry, Steve Albini. But um, <laughs> well, green lab coats over there. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, it, we're supposed to put on a lab coat and, and, and you know, be cautious with, with knobs. In, and I'm just joking, of course. I don't. That's no, no but I, Steve, I, I, Steve does great, amazing yeah, recordings, and yeah. I, and I think he'll turn it up as much as he wants though. anytime he wants. But he's very meticulous. I was just thinking about the lab coats, yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, like we might go in and want to turn up the EQ, but you see that high treble on something, and you're like, yeah, I don't think I'm ever supposed to crank that all the way, mm -hmm. or the bass. I don't think I'm supposed to turn that up all the way. I think you I'm just supposed nailed to be it. I don't think I'm supposed to. And right. like, there's a, again, like learning anything in life. Like, there's a period like where you're, you're, um, you're ignorant to most of like the details and you just go for stuff. Like, especially in music, like, you just go for putting this thing on this. Like I work with a lot of producers who are just now kind of starting to make beats. Like they've been playing music their whole life, but now they're starting to make beats and they're starting to work with stuff. And like, they're doing such crazy inventive shit because they're just trying stuff. And then I think like we get, get to a point where we're, where we get so informed we get past that point of ignorance and then it's like we start we start limiting ourselves like well i read on gear sluts that yeah you, you don't want to boost like plus 12 of anything you want to cut it and then you start like putting yourself in this this um this uh this this pocket you can't get out of and the thing with with recording arts and mixing arts and 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 being an engineer produce, producer is it's a it's a long term release of your skill like you you put this distortion on today and you think it's cool well, the next time you have something similar, your mind's going to go back then and be like, I love that distortion. You're going to do it again. Fast forward a year later, you've been repeating the same process. So if you don't have the uh, the natural kind of flow of trying new things or like really being sure of what you're doing, you kind of create like negative ruts for yourself. I, yeah, you almost have to keep pushing yourself out yeah. of your comfort zone. Yeah. I, I caught myself, uh, the most recent thing is like, um, it's funny, like maybe that this goes back to the decapitator thing. Like all of my mixes just had this like, like big, like mid range bump. Like I just, I could, I could always hear like, what am I doing? Like, what is this thing? Like, and I would just, I saw over time, it's like, man, I'm just high passing too much stuff. Right. I'm like, you know, I'm rolling off like too much, like roll cutting out too much stuff. And after a while, it's like, it just sounds like mid range and you start bringing stuff back. You're like, Oh, listen to all this bass. And, you know, and, and, uh, that just goes back to like being too careful and wanting to like not have things be too boomy and stuff like that. And, uh, and that was just long-term of it building up. Like you're like, Oh, the, a little bit on the kick, a little bit on the snare, a little bit on the guitar, a little bit on the bass. And, yeah. you know, yeah. Well, I was thinking about like, um, you know, not knowing what you're doing, you might get screwy, wild and unusual sounds, or you just get them even by accident, you know, 
But you know, mm-hmm. you talked about it's sort of like the pre, the peer pressure attitude. Like I read on a forum somewhere that we that I should or shouldn't do this. There's also just the internal aspect of like it, it can be it can be a real challenge to learn how to record something high fidelity, and then we might I, I might find myself instinctively trying to get a high fidelity sound and everything, mm. and then it's boring because everything's high fidelity. You know, yeah. it's like it doesn't have the cool factor. We recorded all weekend, and uh, and I was quite happy with a lot of the sounds. Um, and we did, you know, it's probably a mix of some hi-fi, some cool, funky, weird stuff. But then, like, you know, uh, Peter, who was uh, uh, engineering on the project, he he comes in, and we're, we're just cleaning up, and he just, like, pops his iPhone into the speakers, and he's playing his buddy's band from St. Louis. And it's just the coolest shit you've ever heard, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was like, and it's so freaky weird. It's like, it's the, then they did it all on their iPhone, you know? And I'm mm-hmm. listening to these iPhone productions out of the same speakers that are in my studio that we just put in like, you know, days and days of effort and people flew across the country for, and I've got all kinds of microphones and everything. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, man, I don't know that iPhone recording sounds pretty damn good right there. You know, some kid is just like, I don't know what it's supposed to sound like. This just sounds cool to me. It's a thing. And that goes back to the song too. And like, you know, our, our whole um, industry of recording is really, it comes from an era that is based upon like just getting the song quickly. Like there's not a lot of like post-production thought to put into things. It's kind of like what you see is what you get, what you hear is what you get. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I know guys like Tom Dowd were going for great song, great sounds and great songs but I don't necessarily think they were chasing like fidelity or perfection. I don't think they even knew what that meant yet. You know, like rec- like recorded medium had only really existed by the time, like say Tom Dowd had been around like for like 20 years, like not like l- nothing. Like, right. so like there's no baseline. Like, I think we kind of have to get back to that. Like not caring as much. We, um, one thing that I read recently in the, the recent tape op that I, I was, I didn't know and I was excited about is the, the Spotify algorithm now is like set up. So like the volume, the volume automation between tracks is done for you. So you can actually right. put up tracks that aren't super limited, aren't super compressed. And the algorithm is going to make it sound like the tracks that are compressed. And if you over limit, you over compress, it's going to squish it down. It's going to sound like total dog shit. That's what happened to my rough mixes. I put, I made a playlist on um, SoundCloud and lo- and uploaded it there. And it was really interesting to hear that even though I wasn't necessarily, um, you know, equalizing the level between these different mixes, maybe some were quiet or maybe some were loud. There was the one with the guitar that, that I didn't compress was like way too loud. It was blowing up in my car, but SoundCloud like turned it back down to match the other ones. And then it sounded great. And mm-hmm. I was like, huh, that's pretty cool. You yeah. know, hearing it balance it all out for you. It's the same thing. I'm sure again, Tom Dowd thought about with like vinyl records, like, you know, you don't put too much low end because it's going to pop the needle, you know, or like yeah. whatever. So there's, there's always going to be something the medium demands from the music engineering part of it. Well, so uh, we'll take a break now and we'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstars, before uh, we, we go, you can find the stuff we're talking about in the show notes, including a YouTube playlist for um, Brad's music that he's worked on. Just check it out in your listening device or go to rsrockstars.com if you want to hit the website. And then uh, also, if you are getting into mixing yourself, go check out my free mixmasterbundle.com and you can download multi-tracks of my album and I show you in a five video series. Uh, I think it's five videos. It's over two hours of, awesome. of uh, free mix training using stock and free plugins. So go it's check the only that way out. to learn. You have to, you have to see other people do it and like take it away. Yeah. So um, but it's true. I mean, the stuff that I show in that seems sometimes to me like it's, it's some simple, obvious things, but I remember it actually took me a long time to learn all those things and understand how all that stuff worked. So, um, I mean, this is, it's advanced compared to when I first started out and all I was doing was just pushing up the fader louder, like more snare, push it up louder, less snare, mm-hmm. push it down lower. <laughs> if you watch a lot of those, like, like the dead mouse, like master class, like it's not even about what he's doing on the computer. He's like, this is bullshit. This isn't like, that's, that's, that's why it's important. So yeah, yeah I'll definitely check that out. That's all awesome. right, cool. All right. Rock stars. We'll see you in a sec for the jam session. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. 
With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks and you get downloadable multi-tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi-track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is go directly to MixMasterBundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars! It's Lid Sean. We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Brad Dollar, joining us here at the Toy Box Studio. We're going to talk about some of the records Brad's done, more about that, and then we're also going to dig into talking about Zoo Labs and what it means to be a musician slash artist slash entrepreneur in this modern age of getting your music out there. Brad, are you ready to jam? I'm so ready to jam, Lidge. Dude, on. The outer vibe shining like a diamond. Um, it's got a super cool drum sound that kicks in. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how do you think you got that drum sound? Or just generally, how do you like to record drums? What are some things about drums that get you excited about the sound? Recording drums, period. I get super pumped about. I think it's just the engineer in me because you get to put up like more mics than you usually do, more preamps, more compressors. Um, I mean, I'm going to say this a lot probably in this section, but uh, getting it right at the mic is everything. Um, not that I'm like a pro drum tuner, but I'm, I've been lucky to be around a lot of drummers who are good at that and uh, tend to work with drummers on sessions like uh, Noah Snyder on that Outer Vibe session. Great at like drum tuning his kit. Um, so that that was a big part of it. We knew we... we we knew what we wanted. We knew we wanted like deep snare, you know, um, kind of like a towel over the tom, 70s sound, uh, tighter. We knew we, what we wanted. And so that was the biggest part about going into it. Um, I think if you don't know what you want, you're just miking drums. Like you're going to get a, you're going to get a drum sound that doesn't necessarily fit for the song you're making. Sometimes you just need that one mic on the drum set to make it work. Um, for this, cause it's the outer vibe shining like a diamond track. Cause it's a little more like pop rock driven. Definitely everything's close mic and, and whatnot. Um, but then once we got it in the box, we definitely tweaked that sound for a while to make it feel uh, refined and like just processed enough. Yeah, it had a little bit of a crunch crispy to it. Yeah, uh, Maybe talk about some ways to get that because I, I find sometimes I'm capable at getting power and punch, but then I'll listen to some other, I'm like, but why did theirs, even at low volume, sound crispy and cool and mine sound a little bit, you know, muffled or mm -hmm. something? You know, what are some ways to kind of excite you know, what did you say? Give it just the right amount of processing. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a twofold answer. Again, like if you know the sound you're going for, like a, a lot of that kind of comes from the in in the way in processing. Um, like this probably sounds counterintuitive, but a little bit of like uh, crispiness on overheads can help a lot. It may seem like, oh, but the cymbals, but it'll make everything else sound a little a little tighter. On that record, we actually track cymbals separately. So that was a that was a big bonus, which is very time consuming. That's very cool. Let's talk about that, man. That's yeah. a really great technique. It's awesome. I remember Eric Valentine talked about that years ago, and and um, the Foo Fighters, I think, did that on one of their records. What does it mean to record the drum separately? And you you touched on it. You said brighten the overheads, and it makes the drums and maybe the hi hat tight hi hat particularly you know crispy. Mm -hmm. But then people are like, if you've ever done that and you've got somebody who's laying into the cymbals so and stuff washy. like that, you're like. Whoa, Oh, you're ripping my head off. Right. So talk to the rock stars about what that means and, and how you would go about doing what you just described. Yeah, it's it it comes into, and I want to talk about this too. Like it doesn't matter if you're the only the the engineer on the record and there's producers, like you have to come into it knowing the sound that you want to get. Um and doing uh doing this technique of separating the the drums from the cymbals is about thinking about them as actually two different instruments. You know, the cymbals are very high end related. There's no low frequency information. They're also very much like an accent. Uh, if you think about an orchestra, 
Um, think about how often someone with cymbals actually plays. We always make fun of them because they play once, but that's because they only need to happen every once in a while. Right, right. And, uh, but lot, not all drummers think like that. Right. Well, I think, again, it's conditioning. Drummers lean on like, I got to fill the space because if you just, if you sit down a drum kit and you don't play the cymbals, it sounds real empty. And if you play a song and you don't have the cymbals, it sounds even more empty, like something's missing. So, you know, playing playing hi-hats and crashes and rides with your drum set, it helps the song feel more done faster. But if you can just kind of see the house without the furniture for a minute, you can think about the drums as this like low frequency, mid frequency thing you can treat uh, specifically with certain compressors and EQs and like leave your, your overheads and your hi-hats and all this kind of stuff a little more preserved and a little more airy and lifted feeling. Um, so that, that's really what I'm talking about. Like, so you, you would have a drummer, you know, do, do a pass the drums, get them right. And then do a pass of cymbals. And then they, they also get a little more inspired to do different things like swells. They wouldn't do, uh, you know, cool Mike Portnoy crashes. They wouldn't do, um, adding in cymbals that they otherwise wouldn't have had on their kit. Uh, and then in terms of just the sound, uh, uh, there's a lot of weird resonance you get from just cymbals and drums being in close proximities, as close proximity, especially in smaller right. rooms. Right. Um, so that kind of separated. Well, I mean, rock out. stars, think about any time you've thought, boy, that snare needs to be brighter. And then you brighten it and brighten it and brighten it. And you're finally like, okay, now we're getting close. But then you're like, oh man, the hi-hat is killing right now. It's destroying the hi-hat. Right. So it's sort of like the drum shells might be dark and need brightening to sound right. Um, but, or in other words, you might want to put a bright mic on the drum shells because they're opposites potentially. Uh, but then the same thing with with symbols. Symbols might be bright, and you might want to use a dark mic on them. So it's sort of like that contrast of sounds. Right. So what about going through the process of getting a drummer to actually perform without symbols and then perform with symbols? It's a great and, and question. Making that work. Uh, I think about like uh, I think about like scratch passes and rough passes a lot as a, as a template. And so often what I'll do is I'll have a drummer play play through the song the way they would play through it, you know, with the symbols and everything. And that, and a lot of times the band or the other artists that the song is for, like that gives them the lift and then go back and play through it again. You know, um, usually that by the, by the point that we're doing something like that way, if we don't just do it from the beginning, they know the song well enough. They don't need the drums in there. They can just play with play to a click and the existing instruments and get that sound. But, uh, having that kind of scratch track in there, is a good guide for them to be like good guide for them to be like oh okay right here like that we should put crashes here or like oh I heard in that guide track that we put rides in there we should not put a ride in there so just so the guide track, is track play the full kit once yeah so that you know what the part is mm -hmm. it's like your it's your 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 map your outline for right. what, the, what the drum parts can we be. do with vocals right you know down, like yeah. the, like the band's doing the take the vocalist puts down a scratch vocal and they think about it and they try things they thought were right and they refine it later it's the exact same process just kind of from the beginning. And once you get good at it, you can just do it. The drummer will just do it. And they don't need to do the pass. They'll they'll play the drums, and the, it also frees them up to do more interesting stuff with the the the, the toms and the the snare, and do cool press rolls and all that kind of stuff. Okay, let's talk. Let's let's keep geeking on that because I know well, there's the, harder stuff that like when you go to really do it, you're like, oh, I didn't think about that. So, um, do you physically have to remove the cymbals from the drummer? Yeah, yeah. You got out of the way and let them play on just like you know you got are they to. hitting blankets and towels or something or. Do you do you have the sticks hitting things that aren't supposed to be in the mix that you then that become a problem do or that. anything like that? No, don't no. I, like if it's not going to be the song, like don't record it, and that goes for like stick hits because you'll never get those stick hits out. They'll always be you'll, tick, 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 you'll always hear it. Right. In other words, rock stars, if you're trying to record just the kick and the snare, and he's go and the drummer's ghosting on something to pretend it's a hi hat, that little sound of the there it is, hitting my shoulder nice. on the mic. That sound might still sneak through and mm -hmm. become a pain in your ass. I think a lot of your rock stars too will probably, um, you know, will demo in like Logic and Pro Tools and Ableton. They'll have some sort of rough drum sounds. Well, sometimes like, you know, when I'm doing that stuff, when I'm doing song demos, I'm writing, like I'll put up a hi-hat, like so to keep the rhythm going. And you can use that same kind of those same starter stems you started your song with when the drummer's recording or when the, um, you know, the bass is recording so that they can hear that. They're like, oh, that's where the hi-hat's at. I can just play like this. So you can you you can you can trick yourself a little bit. It's kind of like when you when you draw with a pencil first, then you erase the pencil. That's the same process. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. And then when you go to do the cymbal track, remove the drums out of there so they're not hitting like you know a muted drum too. Um, or not. I tend to leave them there because it's a waste of time. It's, it's a easy, pain. <laughs> it's a huge pain in the ass. Set. It's easy to move the cymbals off yeah. and whatnot. Um, yeah. But, and then the other thing about recording drums is to think about like, when you think about the overheads, like if you're just going backwards, if we're 
keeping the cymbals and the drums together, we're not going to separate them. Thinking about the overheads more as like the kit mics and not the cymbal mics because it's different. There's a whole drum kit beneath those cymbals and there's a, there's a, there's a sonic image above the drums, around the drums. It's very encompassing. And the kit mic sound, like that's a big part of the, the outer vibe recordings. Just like um, we had a couple of mics like outside the kit, you know, uh, you know, in front of the kit, uh, four to six feet uh, off the ground, just kind of spaced pair. I, it's probably easier to use those really lean on the ambient mics and also compress them and yes. even distort them slightly if you want, if it's just drum shells. Because when you try and distort it and you've got the cymbal energy in there, it's just going to it's destroy explo- it's everything. explosive and that's yeah. a sound too you know the like explosive symbol thing is a is a sound if and it feels good there's a time and a place for sure um but in terms of like really clean but vibey recordings like you, it's hard to beat separating the drums and cymbals all right so another record you did was ghost and gale and it's got some beautiful vocal harmonies on mm-hmm. it and i wondered if you wanted to talk about or share any tips for recording singers and also helping them to get great performances that are natural and in tune. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, do you, is it? Do we all just need to learn how to use auto tune and Melodyne and just get really good at that, or is it possible to record great performances that are just delivered and sang in tune? How much time do you have? You, well, you I got know. two hours right now for this podcast. <laughs> well, I mean, like as a, as a vocalist, like how much time do you have to do your vocals? You know, like. Uh, I'd say 50-50, I have sessions with artists where we have three hours to do a song, or we've got the whole day to do the whole song. And um, I was talking with um, with someone about this yesterday, you know, like there's within takes one to five, it's either going to happen or it won't. And then you're not going to get it again to like takes 20 through 30. So like if you're down for the long haul, you might find the gold in those takes beyond that. But it's really, it's kind of like right here. And so if, if you don't have that time, that first five, one to five takes, the the tuning's part of it. Um, you just kind of, I think it's just part of the modern sound. It's worth learning. It's worth understanding. Um, and it's also can save a performance. It's really great. And it's just like one note that's just a little off. That's why I love it. Sometimes the, everything about it's the inflection's great. The tone's great. The feeling's great. It's like, oh, that note. So of course I'm going to fix it. Um, with Ghost and Gale, uh, Brody Jenkins and David Lunning, they're both incredible songwriters, incredible, uh, vocalists. Um, Brody's the, the predominant voice on that, on that track. Um, you know, she was raised in a, in a family of like, uh, her, her mom and her sister and her, uh, did some, like they had a record deal when they were like, when she was a teenager and they were like, they were called the Jenkins, you know, like they would toured and, and play music. So she'd been singing her whole life in this, this very beautiful way. Um, the way we did those tracks, uh, and I, I would suggest this for any, um, cause it's basically a duet. Um, I had David and Brody sing together at the same time, um, way, way, way down on my Instagram feed, um, from where that session was, there's a, there's a photo of them in the room and it was basically, a a pair of Elam 251s, uh, and they were facing each other looking like if, if you were sitting at dinner romantically and, uh, David had his guitar and she, and she was at the vocal mic and, and we did, um, you know, lots of, lots of whole takes of getting the whole song. And then we'd go back and punch a little stuff and, and plug it in. Um, so for, for Brody, headphones like, or no headphones, uh, no headphones for that session. Actually, I do a lot of no headphones. If we See, can, I think if that's we what I pick up on. And that's why I want to ask this question and why I want everybody to hear it is this, that reminder that there's a natural blending of voices and harmonies that can happen with two great singers singing together. And when you try and Frankenstein that up into individual multi-track things and overdubs, and it's now it's somebody singing, you know, it's human versus the headphones. Mm -hmm. It's easy to lose that. And then you, and then your only option is to go into the tools like Melodyne and Autotune to try and tune it and do your best to blend it. But it's still never going to sound as beautiful and smooth as, as the way you just described recording it, where it's a, a blend in the air. Yeah. Air is still the best mixer. Air is still you know? the best way. And of course, with the duet, it's it's actually a little easier because you have someone to reference. Like with if they got the harmony wrong, they got they knew right away and they'd fix it. And and Brody's a, a, is super meticulous. And we did go back and do some punches on some of the other songs um, on that record, and uh, you know really dial it in. And and you and I think that um, I think for all, especially vocalists, like trust your intuition around your inflection and your voice, the things you care about. She has certain ways she does things that. I didn't pick up on, but really mattered to her. And so right. it's like, we have to accentuate those things, look for them, remove the things that don't work. And so as a singer, like when you're doing your vocals, like really knowing what those things are and, and it's funny them. that you bring that up because that's something I've thought about before. So as the engineer producer, um, you feel responsible for 
capturing a great vocal performance and and maybe you maybe you're doing a bunch of vocal performances and comping it together and stuff and <clears throat> maybe the artist is even looking to you like oh you're going to if i do the vocals with you it's going to sound great and then you go through this whole process and you comp it all together and you've really got something that that it, that you feel good about and then some of those first times you know maybe the artist comes in and listens and they just make sour faces when it goes by and they're like they're like oh I, I can't stand that one right there and I, I think at first when I would hear that I was like I felt re I really put it on myself I was like oh shit man how did I miss it what are they hearing that I'm not hearing how did I miss it am I mm -hmm. do I really suck at tuning and comping am I terrible at this and then one day I realized I was like no they just there's only one person in the world who is going to pick up on those details about that vocal performance, and it's the the person who sang it. Mm -hmm. They're the only person in the world who knows some of those details. And no matter what you think, and whether it's in tune or out of tune, or what you did as a producer and a, a comper, um, it's still not going to make them like it. They're only going to like it because they pronounce the letter, you know, this one right. syllable this way. And now, if they go re-sing it again, then they'll like it. And so. That was just sort of eye opening too, is is mm -hmm. accepting that like you can deliver your best thing and it's still not done till they come in and listen to it and they pick up on all those things that that only they could know. Mm -hmm. And um don't beat yourself up about it. It's totally fine. And they'll go sing it again and then you do your great comping and put it back in again. And don't beat them up about it. What you just said, Rick, is a is a very important thing. I think uh, all the rock stars, everybody should listen to and, and take into account. It's that, you know, uh, if it's your art, be the executive producer, make it the way you want it. But if we're talking about being producers and engineers for other people's songs, it doesn't really matter if they're paying you a million bucks and you got five Grammys. Like if, if they're not into it, like you can't force that. And I think that when people force things into artists, um, it, sometimes it's right and the artist doesn't know it yet and they just have to find it. Um, but a lot of times it's just always just uh, it feels very contrived. And it feels uh, not natural, and I feel like that's like the like the antithesis of like why we're making music. We're doing this to like uh, you know conjure this thing from our souls and like bring it out to the world. And like when you like make people conjure it in a certain way, like it's not real. They're just kind of like they're manufacturing it. Um, and I, I I see this a lot with like a lot of producers and engineers get irritated with the artist. Like why are you irritated? A you're in a studio making music. There's no there's no room for anger here. It doesn't even matter. Like this is fucking awesome. Um, but like, why are you getting mad at the artists? Why are, maybe they're just hangry. Where's your frustration? Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of like, you know, I, I run into, a, you know, one out of every 10 producers and engineers. It doesn't matter like where you are in the world. It doesn't matter like where, like I've been all over the world. I meet like this one like guy and he's irritated about being in the music industry. You really see it in the live sound field. Like, why is this guy so mad? Like, what do you, what are you truly bitter about? And I think a lot of it comes down to like these individuals like don't have an outlet for their own creativity. And so they try to force their outlet through other people. And that's just not what this is. And I think some of those people are actually best suited to be artists. Um, you know, uh, like Steve Albini is a great example. You know, like you, you hire Steve Albini, you're kind of, you're going for Steve Albini. He's going to give you Steve Albini and you know that. And like, that's also why he had like, uh, you know, he, he's an artist also like why he like puts out these records. Uh, he's probably pretty like, He's probably pretty fair and good to people. I'm sure he's not like aggressive, but he's also like, this is my way. We're doing this, you know, T-Bone Burnett, same thing. Like we're doing it this way, you know, like, so I don't know. I guess I just, I, I think that music, especially in the studio is so collaborative that I'm not trying to ever like, uh, have my, my opinion be the one that overrides that of the artist and the, and the song that ultimately like they're the one who has to, has to go out in the world and carry it and play Bonnaroo with it. And, right, you know, right, true, true. not me. I haven't worked with T-Bone Burnett, but I have worked with Steve and, and he's actually like, it's funny when I, before I met him, I felt like I had heard stories of him being sort of like uh, impervious to, to, you know, alternate ideas and things. And then I met him. He's like the super nicest guy. You okay, got, you ever, I'm you know, happy to be wrong on that. No, no it's That's fine. He's, he's a super cool guy. And, uh, but yeah, he definitely has, um, he's not shy about sharing his opinion on things and, mm -hmm. and he was not shy about calling bullshit on mm -hmm. something. But uh, but definitely flexible too, and like you know, very 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 purist in terms of like, um, I want to capture a great capture of the recording. Like if you want to fuck something up with your instrument, that's great. Um, 
trying to remember how many times. I don't think we really, when we were recording, we were doing a lot of drums and we were doing guitars Is and it, things uh, like Ch that. Ch uh, Chicago, the firehouse? Yeah, it, uh, um, electrical. Electrical, electrical yeah. audio, right, right. And we would have, um, we would have sort of treated a sound before it was captured on a mic as opposed to mm -hmm. like really like doing some crazy mad scientist stuff right. in the studio itself. But right. um, anyway. He's badass though. Just he, he's the, just, he's totally badass. He's super yeah. badass. And he, we, I did a great podcast interview with him too. Um, Rockstars, go check that one out if you want. He talked about, you know, he talked about capturing drum sounds and he gets really powerful drums that are very, they almost have a transparent quality to them, which mm -hmm. is something I really liked. Um, and he also talked about the importance of being very cautious with your EQs between the different mics because you're introducing all these phasing relationships yes. between the different mics and it starts to put the the drum sound out of focus and mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, lose some of its power that way and everything. So yeah, cool, time. cool stuff. I like all the different aspects. I like, it's one of the things I really enjoy about doing the podcast is we get so many different perspectives on how you can approach something that I think the value when you're listening is just like, be inspired. That's mm. it. Be inspired. Right. Go make great records, you know? Be inspired and trust that like also you might have the right way for you. Like you actually might have the right path. And and, and, and that might just be today and tomorrow it's different and that's yeah, totally fine. Exactly. Exactly. And everyone's going a different way. It's just kind of like, where do you want to go? So let's talk about path. Yes. Let's jump to Zoo Labs. Yes. Rockstars, um, I met. Brad this summer at the um, the at a pre summer Nam event, and um, he was telling me about Zoo Labs, where he's uh, is, you know is a co founder or co started this this uh, music in incubator out in Oakland, California. I'm going to let you tell more about it, mm -hmm. but um, when you when you bring up the word path, I'm thinking about that being sort of a, an element of what Zoo Labs is all about, and maybe what the the mission is about is helping musicians and artists and producers and everybody, you know, be on a really um, fruitful creative path. Right? right. So what is Zoo Labs? You said it really well, actually. And I think that the truth is that Zoo Labs, just as music is, is to whatever the artist is that they want. Our main focus is to catalyze artists as, as entrepreneurs and to excite those skills that are already inside of them to, to run strong businesses um, I hear it all the time uh, from every the, mo the most creative, powerful, uh, you know, wonderful artists who don't need any help in the world. They they all want someone to be their manager. They want someone to be their accountant. They want someone to do basically all the work. And um, there is uh, there's a time and a place for that, but there's a big gap between when you start and when you quote unquote make it, where you have to do it yourself. Otherwise, you're always going to be like waiting for someone to come save you. Uh, so Zoo Labs was really started to, you know, give artists those skills to actually get their businesses off the ground. Uh, a lot of it is like Silicon Valley tech-based stuff. A lot of these like, uh, like you know, lean business models, uh, business model canvas, uh, you, you know, different digital strategies and customer ethnography, product market fit. Uh, these things that um, are critical to, to go uh, to get anything going in the, the rest of the business world, especially in the tech world, uh, which is where our, uh, our two main founders, Dave and Vanitha, uh, both come from. Uh, you There's know, something that you said that reminds me of um, one of the things I picked up on when I was first starting to do this, and I was around a lot of other, um, you know, peers who were starting bands or, or making records or whatever. And it's three like death words to your music and your career path. Um, if something happens, that was an expression I would hear people mm -hmm. say. And I began to, you know, somebody would have a band. It's like, yeah, we're doing this and we're doing that. And I mean, it'd be cool if something happens. And I, and I, I started seeing that. And I was like, wait a minute. It hit me one day as I saw different people doing stuff. I, the people that were really seeming to grow and go places that were cool with their music, they something didn't happen. They made stuff happen. Yes. They just did it. They went after it and then you go for right. it. So. And I was just remembering that, you know. It's accurate. It's accurate. And knowing and knowing where to go is about like knowing what you want. And like it's not just it's not just good enough to be like, I want to be successful in music. Like, what does that mean for you? And what does that truly look like? Because it's gonna be different paths. Uh, not every artist wants to tour, and not every artist wants a publishing deal. So, like those are different revenue streams, different models of building up your notoriety and your your business towards those things. And 
Um, you know, Zoo Labs is built around like identifying like what is it, what is it about you that people are connecting to, so you can do more of that. Yeah. So um, I got two responses to my if something happens. One is now when people say it, I go, well, nothing's going to happen. That's like I just try and shut that down right away, just yeah. like so that people don't lean on that. Um, and then the other is what you said earlier, which is, well, yeah, something's going to happen, but it's happening like every single day. And what are you going to do about it? Yeah, you know, it's it's the idea of like you said earlier, waiting for somebody to come along and save the day. That part, that's probably not going to happen. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and I I feel very very lucky to be around a lot of gifted artists that are um, that are rising, like Madame Gandhi, uh, you know, um, Soul Development. Uh, Dovidas, like everyone is like working really hard. Like I'm, I, I since some, uh, Dovidas and I are making a trap rock record right now. I'm programmed all these beats and, um, that's, that, this is his main focus right now is getting this record out. And I sent him these tracks and he's going to give, give me feedback back so we can do another vision, reversion, uh, revision of them. Sorry. <laughs> uh, do another revision. And, um, uh, that was five days ago. He's so logged in and, and bogged down with like, you know, getting, a, you know, some shows together and, and, you know, editing YouTube videos and being on social media. Um, but if he doesn't do those things, he's not going to have the 200,000 YouTube subscribers he has. He's not going to have these fans from all over the world, like, you know, donating money and, you know, giving stuff to his Bitcoin address. You know, it, it takes that. Oh, I love takes, to hear that, man. Yeah. We got to talk more about that. Yeah, too. I'd love to talk about crypto. I got, we can go, we can go left field. With that I for didn't sure. know. I didn't know that was one of the topics for you. Yeah, man, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm a student of many different topics for sure. Um, uh, but anyways, uh, you know, I think that in general, I guess like the, this, this mentality of, of waiting for someone or thinking someone's going to save you just really isn't, it's not reality. And, and when it is reality, those are the stories everyone always like complains about, like, oh, I got fucked by the label or my manager screwed me. It's like, yeah, because you just like let someone like do what they're going to do with you. And at the end of the day, like humans are all in it for themselves. And hopefully you can find other humans who want, who are who, the thing that, that's inside of them is about being connected to other people. And so naturally they do things from a communal standpoint, but it's not like that. And I think if we want to shift the the music business paradigm into being one that really values artists and music, artists have to be at the center of it. They have to be the center of monetization. We need, we need this generation right now to work really hard. So the kids who are like 11 and 12 right now, when they enter the music business, they will, they won't work for free. They won't sell their songs for free. They, they will have a strong business sense when they go out and they book a tour or they buy merch. Like they're not going to just like hope and wish and, and, and follow other things. The other thing I just want to say that Zoo Labs really pushes artists to break is like thinking outside the traditional model for whatever they're doing. If you are like a rock band and you're like, we're going to tour and play shows, we're going to push you every way we can around you not doing that. Like what, if that's the thing you're supposed to do, like what is all the other stuff you could be doing that you're missing? Because it's, um, it's kind of like an oasis, right? Like you can't like keep going to like the same, like pull all the animals are at. You have to look for different places to drink water and grow things in. And that's well, what, like what you said about, you know, if you have a reference track for the production you're about to do, how can you look to that reference and then do what you're going to do slightly differently? Like kind of go slightly around what that vocal sound normally would be and stuff like that. Right. Same thing with, for the career path. It sounds like you're describing. So, uh, but thing. keep telling us though. So, um, I'm getting some of the sort of meta around what Zoo Labs is, but like, what is it? Oh, is you it want a, you want brass tacks? I told you I'm like, like long winded and like yeah. mystery ethereal. No, so it's uh, it's this this great uh, place out in uh, Oakland, California, West Oakland, uh, which is just outside San Francisco. It's right. The first like um, BART is our our our, our transit system. Uh, it's the first BART stop over the Bay Bridge. Um, it's got three, like definitely world-class studios in it. One's got an SSL duality. One's, got, you know, it's like the studio A, big live room, bunch of different ISOs. Uh, there's a studio B with like barefoots and like nice ISO setup. There's a, a studio C, a studio Z. There's all these different spaces to make music in. There's also offices, there's apartments, um, there's workshop rooms. And the idea is that we have, uh, artists come four times a year. Like we have teams of artists. And I say, we say the word teams because you might be like a, like a, like a vocalist, a manager and a, and a painter, you might be a band. It's always something different. You're a team. It's what you want. And so four times a year, we have three teams come stay there for two weeks. Uh, in the morning they wake up and they, um, uh, they have some sort of workshop around business model building the afternoon. They go into, we call them war rooms and they actually build their business models and kind of like put some, like some tactics around it. People like different mentors come in, people come in and like give them opinions and then the second half of the day through like the, the evening, like they're in the studio and they're making music and they're, they're building, they're building new music based around the trajectory they're trying to go. 
because uh, Zoo Labs is a nonprofit, we don't charge them anything to come and be a part of the space. Wow. It's amazing. Um, it's a lot more freedom for them to try stuff. And we also don't have expectations for like, when you leave, we need four songs that are like this. Some artists leave and like everything they made is like kind of garbage, but the stuff they do right after when they come back is it's the goal. It's like what they were going for. It's like what mm. helps them lift off. And that's where we want them to get is thinking beyond just like, I have five songs. I'm going to record them, put them out. Like maybe those aren't your best five songs. And maybe you need to understand what your fans are connecting with. So you can make more songs like that. Where do you find the artists and the students that come and participate in Zoo Labs? It's a lot of word of mouth. Um, we, we have a pretty low acceptance rate. Uh, we have like a 21% acceptance rate. So art, artists apply to the program with their team. Um, our community now of like 300 artists and mentors, um, they review the, f- the first round of applications that comes in, uh, you know, twice a year. So, so as an artist, you might view this like applying for an art grant or something. It's a lot like that. It's a lot, it's, it's like, it's applying for like a, like a residency, you know, yeah. you're, you're applying for a space to come work on your stuff and get supported while you build it. Um, the thing that's different about Zoo Labs is we continue to support you beyond that. And that, that residency, that two week is like the intro for us to get on the same page, us to know what you're about. You, you know what we're about. And then, and then get after it. And, um, you know, we just, we just want to like give, uh, give a sense of, of purpose to what people are actually putting out in the world. And again, like with this, like the, the, the generational, like buildup of this, like if we can get more artists to think entrepreneurially, it's going to become the mass effect, you know? Well, let's dig into some of that. Let's talk about, um, one of the expressions that I heard on a video there, which was content is currency. And I wondered if you could explain what that means for musicians um, as artists and entrepreneurs. Oh, so, <laughs> so many ways to explain this. The bi- the biggest way I can think about that is that you just can't make, it kind of goes back to like the one or, a, or make a hundred songs to get the one, you know, you can't just like make your five songs, you and the band, you know, I know you guys worked really hard every weekend for a year to get these five songs, but it's not enough because let's say, let's say those five songs are perfect. Let's say that like you have a manager and you have a distribution deal and a hundred thousand dollars behind you and you put it out. That five songs is going to be like just devoured voraciously. And then people are going to be wanting more. And then you're, then that's like having a business where like they're coming for like your food, but you're out of food and that's a horrible place to be. So content is like, that's your, that's your, that's your, your bucket to catch the rain. Um, whether it's songs or Instagram photos or YouTube stuff. You, you have to be creating things all the time. And the reality is that that's always been happening. If you, um, you know, go back to the Eagles, uh, Lish has this awesome, you know, 70s MCI desk, uh, you know, like there's all this content, photos, you know, artwork, the the record, promo stuff, like all, like all the stuff went into capturing this to they actually promote and put the record out. It wasn't just like they spent a month in the studio, they recorded the songs and that was it. It's all this, this package. So it's been going on for a very long time. Now, Artists are just kind of like responsible for it. There's no one to do it for you. Um, so yeah, content is currency. If you think about every song you do as a possible revenue stream, like you want to have as many as you can. And it's not about the music making money. It's about, not, not, you know, hopefully it does that. It's more like the music being like the the billboard for who you are and people coming to you. And Right. You know. Well, let's talk about some basics around that. What are some elemental things about um, how you package and deliver your content to the world and share it with them? that are the, you know, some things that people forget? I mean, do we all just put it up for free on SoundCloud or on YouTube or do we get more clever than that? Are there, um, is it, is that a question that can only be answered on an individual basis, depending on who you are and what you're doing it? Or are there some bits of advice you want to share with the rock stars that are just general approaches? For example, Mm. um, a question that I might get from somebody who hasn't necessarily been doing much of this might be like, I wrote a song or I recorded it. Now what do I do? Do I go? Do I apply to the Library of Congress for my copyright? You know that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. what 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 are some answers around those generalities that you that you want to educate people? Yeah, about? Yeah, totally. Well, we're in a great time where a lot of services have uh, have arrived to help with this. Um, it is it is difficult to navigate. Um, there's a reason why in Nashville, like being an admin person is like a career. There's a reason why, like, you can have a whole life, like, working at Warner Brothers just doing admin. It's 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 hard, and it's complicated, and it requires a lot of, like, knowledge of what's happening right now. Um, but with things like DistroKid and SongTrust, there's a lot of ways for you to just, like, get your music in one place, and they kind of compress all those different elements into, like, easy steps. So, like, if you were to try to put your music on by yourself on Apple, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, like, I would take, take you forever 
maybe a massive spreadsheet of you trying to figure out what you did and when you did it. But things like DistroKid exist and just kind of gets it out there for you. Um, now, that's not to say like that you should not still like have like legal co- uh, consult and people to like look over what you're doing. You still have to like register stuff with like the Library of Congress. But you also have to think about like what's right for you and what what um, what you're actual like actually trying to do with your music. You know, if this is if you're just trying to like put some songs out to get some attention on Instagram, like don't go through all that, you know, pay the fee for DistroKid, put it up and like. You know, if if you have to go to court because your song gets picked up, that's a good place for you to be. You know, like oh man, like I didn't even know that was going to even be that big of a deal. Um, I think sometimes we all, we treat ourselves like Beyonce when we when we're not there yet. You know, and so we have to kind of be a little more humble and realistic with where we're at. Um, but I think that um, I think that in terms of like you know you just you just put a song out or you, you sorry you just record a song you want to put it out you want to connect it with people uh, you ca- you have to develop a plan that's actually going to work for your lifestyle. It's a lot like dieting and like going to the gym. I swear. Like if you're like, I got to lose 50 pounds. So I'm going to hit the gym seven days a week and I'm not going to eat any carbs. Like that sounds like it's going to work, but you're actually not going to be able to stick with it. Um, uh, speaking from personal experience, I, uh, you know, I, I, earlier this year, I was like, I'm going to start a YouTube channel and I'm going to shoot YouTube videos every day. And like, and then I was like, I'm not going to do this. Like, oh, there's no way I'm actually going to do this. And so that's, that wouldn't be a good strategy for me. But for Adobe Das, that is his strategy. Like YouTube is the thing and that is working for him. So just being honest with yourself, like what you're actually going to be able to do, or like maybe, maybe your thing is Instagram stories and you just focus on that. You don't need to be the, you don't need to do everything. And I think that's what most people are like yeah. messing up. They're just trying to do it all. And then like, yeah. that's not, maybe that was the answer five years ago, but it's not the answer now. Well, there's the, there's the idea of, you know, if the effort you have is put into in every direction at once, you're going to put in maximum effort and you're going to be lucky if you see, you know, the needle move, you know, a centimeter in each direction. Whereas if you picked one of those directions and put all that same effort in, you're going to move the needle, you know, a a meter or something Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I was making that up, but it's good, you know, um, and that can be really effective and it's a hard one to do, um, especially when we're surrounded by all these different social medias and stuff like that and trying to figure out which and what you want to use. There are some things that can help. For example, I'm, I'm putting out um, weekly content with this podcast Mm -hmm. and my first focus was podcast. That was like, I want to have a podcast. I want to do this. I want to interview people. It's going to, I know how to get it onto iTunes and put it up that way. And then it took me a little while before I was like, all right, now I'm ready to figure out how do I get this to co-publish on YouTube automatically at the same time so that the podcast is also existing there for people Mm -hmm. to find and share. And, um, you know, stuff like that. And then social media, you know, I'm not in Instagram all the time or anything like that. And I think that different social media platforms also resonate with different um, age groups. Bingo. And know? people. Where, where and are people. your people at? You know, like um, you might have a lot of fans in Italy. And like if you're not like marketing to Italian people, you're not going to know. Um, I, I, I'm trying to market myself as a producer engineer to like Japanese and Chinese people right now. because Really? I, I'd love to go. There's a lot of music and shit happening over there. I want to yeah. go over there and work, but that's not going to happen with me just like putting an Instagram post up. Like I have to like, I'm starting to like translate certain hashtags into other languages. And like, you know, I, I do a lot of testing with that on Instagram to see if actually like certain things stick and certain things don't. Like I, I want to know for myself, like how these algorithms are actually working. And so that's um, fascinating. I think just, just, just tar- targeting to like who your people are and actually like serving them. Um, I, I'm a big believer in like the, the 10 people that love you and care about everything you do and will pay you whatever you want is so much better than the thousand people who just care about you a little bit passively, Yeah, you know, like, which is a lot of the world. Like, you know, you go to like a big festival, like Bonnaroo, or someone could be there to see like the weekend and they'll be so pumped. It's the weekend, but they won't stay for the whole set. They'll watch it for a few minutes and they'll walk away. They'll go see something else. They just want a little bit of it. It's too much. You know, that's all. Um, Oh, what was I going to say? Uh, shoot, I had an idea. I just forgot what it was. <laughs> It'll come back to me, hopefully. Um, the boomerang. Maybe more more tips. What about um, oversharing? You know, um, you talked about striking that balance where it's like you're making a record, but you also got to get that YouTube video out, and, and that's how you have the audience of 200,000. Mm-hmm. Um, is there also the imbalance where you're like spending too much time and energy in the social media and you're missing, you know, you're missing the mark and, and you're kind of oversaturating. What advice do you have for the rock stars around, you know, striking the right balance or even just knowing that you're striking the right balance? I think that we 
all creatives have to learn how to kind of balance mystery a little bit and being a hair out of reach. Um, the, we all chase things that are out of reach for us. Like, you know, we don't chase things we can reach out and grab, you know, that's too easy. Um, you know, that's not even a chase, it's a reach. And so I think just like really thinking about, thinking about that is the, the biggest part of it. So um, maybe just sort of do what you feel comfortable with. It's kind of like the diet you just said. Right. You can't, do what you can actually do. Do what I, you can do. I think do. comfort is like as, as a way to like kill yourself in a lot of ways. Like I don't think that we should – like the human body is naturally trying to be comfortable. Like and we grow because we try the things that are uncomfortable and they became they become part of us, you know, like yeah. um, you know, with, with, uh, with recording and going back to like getting high fidelity stuff like you were saying earlier. Uh, you know, like after a while, like getting good, good drum sounds is easy. And you're like, how do I, how do I change this? And I think that's the great, the great magic of the, the, the path of like the, the recording producer engineer is like, there's, there's certain fluctuation points where like you learn so much that you can just forget about all of it and just go for it from your heart again, from the intuition. It's like the skill is like in your belt. Like I really, um, I've been listening to back and forth, like Santa gold and like dream theater yeah, and like, nice. just listen to like, like how like these things just fall out of him, like fall out, fall out of them. Like, you know, like her, her words fall out of her so naturally, like they don't feel very tuned. It feels great. Like John Petrucci's guitars. It's like, Oh, this, th- these notes here, it just comes out of, out of them. It's cause I can tell like they're, they're trying, but they're not trying. It's just, they're letting the natural part of what they already acquired come into them. I think we're always trying to like feed the thing we just learned to the thing we're doing right now, but it's not like that. Like it doesn't like, always connect so directly. Yeah. It's like, and, and and if you just kind of focus a little more on like where your, your heart lies, I keep saying this, but like you focus a little more on where your heart lies and what you're, you, you feel naturally like that you're gravitating towards. That's like where like the quote unquote ease of things come along. Like mm-hmm. if you can work the long hours, you can, you can do all these Instagram posts. Like you just, you find your, you find your, your stride and you, and you, and you just, you run with it. Yeah. You probably know when to take a break too. You know, I love like, taking breaks. Yeah. I love taking breaks. I don't believe that like being present at your work equals like productivity or right. progress. Like right. just cause you're at your, your, your studio, or you're at your instrument playing for eight hours. doesn't mean you actually did anything. Like what are you trying to accomplish with that time? Um, I'm a big believer in like, you know, like three to four hour chunks, like just get in, dive in deep, maybe shorter for some people, but like yeah. do that and then come back, like have lunch, have, have a snack, see your, see your significant, significant other, whatever you need, and then come back to it. And whether you start the midnight and you do this process, or you do it like, you know, six in the morning. I think the break is. Well, I, I think about some of the stuff you're talking about and, and sort of, you know, um, being, a little bit more playful with the sounds and the creativity and trying stuff so that you're not stuck doing the same careful things or whatever. And those strike me as decisions that you can make quickly. You're like, Oh, I wonder what this idea would look like, Mm -hmm. you know, and you try it quickly. And when you allow yourself to work quickly like that, then you can try the thing and then you can go like, okay, that's good. I'll take a break from it. And then you stopped working on it. Cause if you keep working on it, you're going to undo the thing that you just did and bring it right back to you know, uh, a perfectly balanced gray, you know, <laughs> that's the thing. That's the killer. Is in a mixing, horrible you know? color. It's the worst when you're like, you're, you, you, one of the first things you go through mixing is you're like, you try to perfectly balance everything. And then you, mm-hmm. and you get there and you're like, oh yeah, I've got all salts in there. Right. There's a little bit of that. Little. And then mm-hmm. you step back and you listen and you're like, oh shit, this doesn't sound like anything. You know, this is, yeah. this is totally lifeless and not interesting. And all those details you were listening to, you know, you you look at the person in the back of the room, you're like, do you hear the, tam- which one of these tambourines do you like it this way and that way? And they're like, I, I can't, I'm, I'm really sorry. I can't even, I had an artist who was saying this and she's like, I can't even hear what you're talking about. I have no idea is that I don't even hear the tambourine mm-hmm. in the mix. And I was like, all right, something's not working. Yeah, here, something's you know? not right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, people, when people can't hear this thing that you're focused on, either it's like irrelevant or um, actually there's a problem. You yeah. know, you should be be aware of and try to try to work through. Yeah, I think that I think that we we try to overcomplicate things a little bit just for the sake of doing it. And I also think that um, getting to that point where y- where you yourself can feel like this doesn't make sense. Like I don't like. I hear these notes you're singing and I got the preamp level right, but it doesn't make sense what you're doing. Right. Like that's, it's kind of like. And and that's a good comment. I say that to people sometimes. Instead of criticizing what they're doing, I just say, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't get it. It's confusing me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like you might say, say to an artist, you know, like 
you know, like I don't get something they'll say, they'll get defensive and they'll say, of course you don't get it. And they'll do one of two things. They'll either like go home and think about that and say, fuck you and do more of the thing they were doing, which is really cool if they dial in deeper or hopefully they'll be like, man, is he right? Is he wrong? Okay. What if he was right? What can I, what can I think about different? And I I think uh, going back to zoo labs, like the biggest thing that we want to try to do, and I think artists can start doing right now is try to validate your assumptions Whatever you think about yourself, if you're like, people connect to my music because it's like electro rock, like go find that out. Is that really what it is? They might, they might connect with your music because they love your style. They love, they love your podcast that you do. Like it might not be your music at all. Um, my friend, Brandon McCartney, otherwise known as Lil B, um, people, you know, like he's, a, he's a decent artist, but he's a really great human and a great personality and people, uh, they connect with that. He's a, he's a beacon of positivity and it doesn't matter if he puts out like gold or garbage, like people will love what he does because they're connected to him. And I think like just being honest with yourself with where you're at, like, you know, like you don't have to be like, you know, the, the, the pinnacle if you're a singer, like it's okay if you're not Aretha, like as long as you're like bringing the same energy that you feel like Aretha embodies in you, then like you can, you can be that. Somebody might tell me I'm wrong for this, but not everybody loves Aretha Franklin. Right. That's right. one exactly. thing that, that makes it possible for all of us to do something we want to do is that that for every creator out there, there uh, that's unique, there's also an an audience member or, or a listener or a viewer or a watcher that's unique too that might connect with that person. Right. There's going to be somebody, you know, you guys may be listening to this podcast and enjoy the sound of my voice. And thank you very much if you do. <laughs> and also um, Brad's, but, um, you know, there's going to be somebody who's dialing into this and they hear two seconds of my voice and they're like, oh, that guy's horrible. And they just hang up and go to a different podcast. Mm -hmm. And that's great. That's fine. You know, that's the beauty of having this giant um, outreach now through the internet is that you can put yourself out there and you can just find the people to connect with. And that reminds me of the question that I couldn't remember that I wanted to ask you, which was you're Boomerang. talking about I told you. going for, um, you know, your, your, find out who your audience is. And my question was just simply like, well, what if you don't know who your audience is? What mm -hmm. are your thoughts about finding that out? Mm -hmm. The first thing I can say is to not start with who you think they are. Like, uh, if you're, if you really are like, I don't know who my customers and my audience is, like your first thought might be, okay, I should ask my friends and, and my mom or my family. And like, uh, it's just not a good place to start because you're going to get answers that are much more based upon you, which is good. You might get some of those threads, but a lot of it comes around again, like assumptions, like what, like, what do you want to find out? Like, let's, I, I always go like my, my optimist self always goes to like, let's go to like the, the big dream. Let's say you got the funds. Let's say you got the manager, the songs, all that stuff. Like, and now like, and now you know, your manager is going to bring a group of customers around and you, you can ask them any questions you want. And those questions are going to help you make better art and make better stuff. What are you going to ask them? Like, what do you want to know? Um, and nine times out of 10, those questions will find their way circulating around. Like, what is their life? Like, where do they participate in music? What do they care about? What are they into? Uh, you know, See, this is fascinating to me because these are the lessons that I've learned about um, entrepreneurship and and startup businesses and things like that, where you're like, all right, if I'm going to create a, a business, then I should find out uh, if you have a business that is going to connect with a customer and the customer's, you know, that's the, the implicit thing is it's an exchange of value. A customer would pay you money for something that you provide them. Then you have to figure out, well, what is that customer's need? that I can help offer a solution to. But a question I've asked on the podcast before is like, how do you apply that to music? What, what creative music thing that comes from you are you doing that's providing a, a you know, a, a need and a solution? And it sounds like you're beginning to touch on that idea. So maybe keep going on that. And mm -hmm. what does that mean? Like, is there a crossover between what it means to be an entrepreneur in a business kind of service business and being an artist? I think that we would all do ourselves a great service to stop disconnecting those things because, you know, we're we're all conditioned first as customers. Um, we're conditioned first to say, what can this thing do for me? But as a business, whether you're a service provider or a product creator, it doesn't really matter. You're you're it's for other people. It's not for you. If it's for you, you just make it yourself and call it a day. It's not a business. But when other people are involved and you're doing it for other people, then like, what is it again that they, that they, they want to be a part of? 
And I think just trying to figure out like how you, how you fit into people's lives. That's, that's what's going to dictate like what you should do more or less of. That's what's going to dictate, you know, like, oh, we tried this thing that felt so unnatural and no one liked it. Well, good. You don't have to do that anymore. And if, and if you don't ask people, then there's no way of, of knowing and asking people at a show, like where, like, you know, they're, I've, they've already come to see you. Like, that's not, that's not a good way of doing it. You know, like you almost like, there's a book that everyone should read called the mom test. Uh, it's by, uh, it's by Fitzpatrick, I believe. And, uh, the mom test is about the mom M O M. Yeah. The mom test. It's the concept is like, you know, you, you build a product. It's very startupy, you know, you build a product and you're like, you, you take it to your mom. You're like, mom, what do you think about this? And the reality is like, mom's going to say, I love it. It's great. But oh, that's lovely, that's honey. Lovely. Oh, and by the way, what, what do you want for dinner? And are, did you get your clean underwear? I left them for you on the back stairs. Exactly. Exactly. She's going to say, say something, but you didn't ask like, like, um, let's say, let's just be techie for a second. Let's say you made an app. Like, you know, did you ask your mom if she even uses her iPhone? Did you ask your mom if she cares about this app that you built at all? Like it, the answer might be like, well, actually, honey, like I haven't used my iPhone in a while. Uh, and I just, it's not a big part of my life. Like, you know, right away, like that's not your customer and you shouldn't ask any more questions or you need to start thinking about other things. Like mom, what would it take for you to start putting your iPhone in your life? What would it take for you to start using an app? And you might find a hole that you can fill. And if you just extrapolate that to music that people are like, man, I fucking love Kanye, but I just, I, I want a little more of like this, like cage the elephant vibe that I've been hearing recently. You're like, damn, that's cool. I keep hearing that from people. They I want, just like- want him to start a set on time when I was at Bonnaroo. <laughs> Years ago, <laughs> I think everyone um, does. But you know it, yeah. what? What sparks the idea for me, um, asking the question, hearing you talk about it too, is realizing that it's what you said. Also, when you don't know your audiences, don't try and guess yet. Just, just maybe put yourself out there. And it just occurs to me that if you're an artist and you're making your own music and you're making it from your heart and you're doing your thing, you put yourself out there. And the more you do it, you're going to, at some point, you're going to begin to connect with some people and you're Mm -hmm. going to start to build an audience of people who dig what you do. And then at that point, you now have a dialogue with some people who do give a shit about you and your music. And at some point in there, there actually is going to be a need that can be filled and you can begin to understand if it's a live show, it might be, it might, maybe it's much more simple and basic. Like it's like, okay. Do does our audience really want it to be like iced down like a refrigerator in this club, or mm-hmm. do they want it to be outside with a nice breeze? Experience you know I mean? is a big thing. What experience are you giving to them? Like we don't often think about um like the experience a fan has when they go into a show or um when they when they find your track on Spotify. There's an opportunity to sort of uh, engineer the whole thing you want. And you know, you're doing it right. If you're like, well, that's what I thought about in the first place. And like, good. Like you, again, you want to get to a place where it feels like you, because that's what you're going to be able to repeat all the time. Uh, slightly stupid is a great example. Like they know their fans are stoners because they're stoners. Right. And like, if they, if they were going to be super straight laced and like, you know, play like something other different kind of music and market to different kinds of people, like they would have a hard time being themselves. They, they would probably self-destruct. They probably wouldn't write the music they love, but they just do what they love. And not only are they self-sufficient, they're thriving, you know, like they are their record label, like they are their studio, like they are their touring crew. Like, I don't, I think they have like some distribution, but like they're doing their own thing and they're just, they're, they're, they're being themselves. Metallica is a great example. The, The more Metallica always goes back to like who they truly are, the more the fans are happy the better the record sales are, the better the tours are, you know, and every time yeah. that they've ever gone the other direction, it's good for them, which is important to always do things that are good for your creative self, but not good for their audience, not good for their fans. Maybe they got new fans and new audiences, but long-term that those weren't long-term fans. You know? Well, I think it's really empowering. So it, cause it makes me think like, instead of me feeling like the problem solved that I might need to do for uh, a, a fan of my music is trying to figure out how to write just the right verse about heartbreak and that that's what's going to be the connect, then it might be more like, no, it's okay for me to write whatever weirdo bullshit I'm writing now because that's what comes out of my head mm-hmm. and just let it evolve naturally. And then as I you know, begin to go out and play shows and have a band and I'm in a place, maybe just find out if the people who come to my show just really want to have a good IPA on tap and I should play at that club with the, where the sound is decent and the beer is good, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's as simple as stuff like that. Um, yeah. Maybe talk also a little bit about, uh, you know, growing the connection in the audience. Like, do you want to talk about some tips about just simply building an email list? Mm-hmm. Is it important to have an email list anymore as a mm-hmm. band? Yeah, definitely. And for, again, for me, I, I'm, 
I'm a studio rat. Like that's me. So, but I, I don't separate creating music from how it's going to get out into the world. That's very important for me. I actually don't take on work anymore unless it's got an outlet. You either need to, like I said earlier, either you have like, you know, some fan base that you really, that really cares about you and you work with, or you have a distribution deal. It's, um, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's got, it's got to get out in, in the world. And so I think that for everybody, they're going to have something that's personal to them that works. I think the email list is good. I've had a lot of success with email in my life. Um, got a lot of great projects and walk into a lot of great things because of cold call emails. I've made myself very available via email um, through my entire life on- online. And, um, I have a really strong list and I-, I see a lot of other artists have a strong list. And, and now the email list has kind of become this thing where it's, it's not the first touch point. It's kind of like the touch point for those who are close to you. So it's a little more sacred and also people aren't really checking it as much. And so when they see something that's like not from Amazon or, you know, like men's journal, like they're like, Oh, like, that's cool. Like this is, it just didn't show up in my promotions tab. So, um, I think that's, that's a really important thing, but um, basically all we're talking about is uh, a group of people that you can reach out to right. that is going to like pick up the other, the other end of the phone yeah. and you just got to figure out like what they want most. Um, I heard like someone, you said, it might be a, a story on Instagram might be more effective at somebody checking it out and hearing what you just said than sending them an email per, right. perhaps. And to that point, I wanted to just talk a, talk a hair about analytics and like, like understanding- the numbers around, around we can people. handle it. <laughs> we, yeah. I mean, well, I think it's like, it's, it, this stuff is like, Oh God, I got to think about it. But, um, like if you're thinking about, say your, your, your audience, as a, let's say you're a recording studio or you're, and you're trying to get more, more clients, like what is the age range? Like who, who are they? Where are they at? What can you do to, to reach out to them more directly? Uh, and understanding those things is really going to dictate a lot of not just like what you do creatively, but also like your business, uh, I heard someone today over at um, at home over in over here in Nashville, and uh, you know they were they were asking you know is is should I get into Snapchat or Instagram? And I didn't want to interrupt because I was actually like printing out uh, my prep for this podcast. But I wanted to be like, well, what what's your age group for your fans? If your fans are young, if you got like a toy company, like you should be on Snapchat. But for basically everything else, you should be on Instagram, right? So just thinking about like where they're at, or you know, if if you have a very like female centric audience, like what what are they like? Where are they at? Like what do they care about? And now that a lot of like individual websites have kind of gotten their own followings of people on subscription lists. You can kind of just go there. Like where are the, where are the websites people frequent? Like where are the, where are they going for news sources? Like if you're really into hip hop, like maybe it's all the, maybe it's on the fader, you know, if you're really into indie rock, maybe it's, you know, pigeons and planes, you you know, these are, these are blogs, but also, you know, there's, there's tons of individual personalities that have started like, you know, groups online that you can uh, kind of gravitate towards. So that's cool. That's good advice. Um, all right. So let's, Let's talk for just one second about home. Um, I don't think we really got a chance to talk about that. That's a pretty cool thing that's happening right here in East Nashville. And um, Rockstars, wherever you are in the world, there may be some sort of music incubator where you are as there well. There probably is. There's but th- but tell us what home is here. Yeah, home um, is actually a lot like Zoo Labs. Home is uh, short for helping our music evolve. Uh, acronyms are great. Actually, uh, whenever I do sessions at my house, I have to call them like the song title plus Mikasa. I get them confused, like home and my actual house are different now. Um, but, you know, basically like a lot of people uh, in in Nashville and all kinds of music communities, they need a central place. They can go meet each other, have writing sessions, have coffee, uh, get some studio access. And um, home has emerged in here in Nashville is kind of being this like this, this center membership kind of base club where that can happen. And I think for a lot of people, myself included, like I'm not really a schmoozer. Like I love this, like talking to people one-on-one. A lot of my close connections in my life come from being in sessions. You really won't find me out at shows, like handing out business cards and doing that kind of stuff. And I feel like home is that is that environment of like just meeting people very organically and naturally. You know, you bring your laptop and set up to do some emails. You bump into somebody, you have a great conversation, you meet a publisher. Um, they have like different mentor sessions. They have different like workshops people come to, uh, it's really affordable. Um, it's also kind of a, just a, the shared workspace vibe, right? When we have yeah. all these, if you're, if you're working all day on a computer and a laptop, then maybe you understand this entrepreneurial startup shared workspace vibe, which says, don't, you don't have to spend all day in a coffee shop. If you want to go to work somewhere, you can go to a shared workspace, be a little more focused and right. still have good coffee. Yeah. But for the musician, 
you know, it's like, well, where do you go if you shared workspace? You need to bring an acoustic guitar with you, you know? Right. And it sounds like home is that kind of place. If you, you know, you can book out a rehearsal space, you can book out the studio. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll do that a couple of times as an artist. And then you'll just start coming in the mornings without your guitar just to meet people. Um, it's, it's a, the biggest thing missing from the music industry, which um, I think is definitely beautifully here in Nashville is um, the music and the business side are always like meeting, always, always talking, always, always, you know, um, figuring something out. And that's, that's what I see over there. You know, you can walk in and you could be like, dude, I fucking rock out on the gold, gold top less Paul all day, man. I don't care. And meet like a great music attorney. Who's like, dude, I fucking love music law. What's up? You know, like that's that those connections have to happen. We have to like demystify the process for each other. We have to demystify like things are scary and that we're afraid of and, and you need those environments and you'll find them organically just by like going certain places and whatnot, but, um, wh wherever they can congregate, I think is, uh, you know, something, some place worth being around. So that, that's what home is. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, we've been going for a while. Let's jump into our jam session questions and kind of close out here. But, um, let's see if we can, uh, hit these rapid fire and, okay. and we'll, we'll just rock through them and see how it goes. We'll I'm long winded. Like, I told you. Yeah, we'll, we'll pretend like we're one of these, you know, hot TV shows where everything's like bam, bam, bam. <sighs> what? Uh, what was it? Uh, the the um, what was the one with the actors' room? What's the what's the one? Uh, oh. You know, like the uh, anyway. You know which one? I know, I know. I uh, know. So, so let me ask you this one, Brad. <laughs> um, when you started out in recording, what was holding you back? <laughs> I was thinking about the, the Zach Alphanakis between two ferns. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Not, not trusting in my own writing, like not trusting in my own mus musical abilities. Uh, I started playing music first before I ever got into recording. And, um, you know, I would say the first like few years, I just kind of disregarded it and like, was like, oh, it's separate. Let the artists do it. And um, the last five years, I've been like just folding it back into my life in the way that I produce and engineer records. And, uh, and you know, I am a writer. Like I, I, I write top lines and fucking build beats and it's a part of who I am and uh, I just don't ignore it anymore. Nice. Um, just for definition's sake, I feel like top line is a, is a, a phrase that I've heard in the last five years and I never, ever heard it before. What mm -hmm. is a top line for somebody who doesn't know what that is? Top line basically means that because you can just write parts of a song and like put them in Ableton and Bro Tools and all that stuff, like the top line is that melody, it's the hook. You used to not be able to isolate that. People have been writing melodies and top lines forever and giving them to the artist to sing. But now, because uh, music is so team-based and, and groups come around to like make the great song really quickly, you have people who are uh, really gifted at writing writing melodies like that um, and, and writing like good short phrases. I ha I happen to be really good at that. Lyric, better, better lyric than write, too, writing verses. or you, yeah, you take yeah, the lyrics and lyric lyric and melody together. And and I also am, am highly collaborative and I don't work in an, in like a silo. So for me, like uh, I like to like I call myself a music catalyzer because I like to put the spark out there. The artist is like, no, I would say this and sing it like this. Like perfect. You're a I'm not a singer, and b like you know you're the one who has to like own these words. So. Yeah, so I, I like I like you know putting like the the spark out there for those things to create and get Dig going. It. Dig it. So that, that's that's the top line. It's the melody. It's the hook. It's the the catch of the song. Share with us some of the best advice you received. Best advice I ever received. Uh, man. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I thought about this a little bit. Um, the best advice I ever received was to fix it at the mic. And that's not just like about like the sound, it's about the player, it's about the vibe. And after a while, you can always hear like when something's wrong, like, oh, the singer's not happy or they're on their phone or, you know, like this drum doesn't sound good. Let's not like put a bunch of crap on it. Let's just like fix the drum or let's change the mic. Like just trying to get things right, like where it's happening, not later. And uh, as producers and engineers and songwriters, like we really tend to like try to just like do it later, but you gotta, you gotta do it right now. I thought of an analogy too. Um, if you have a blue drum out on the floor and in the control room, you really want a red drum for this mix, saving it for later is thinking that we're just going to add a bunch of red to the blue drum and all you get is shit brown. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you get purple. But you're probably going to get brown. Yeah. All right. You're probably yeah, you going to get brown. Get, you might get purple. Purple's pretty cool. Purple's cool. It's hard though. Um, yeah. But you know, it's like go out and just change it out. Just put a red drum out there before you press record. You know. Yeah, there absolutely. Thanks for indulging me, rock stars. All right, recording tip hack or secret sauce: something the rock stars can use today on their next session. Uh, learn to be adaptable and don't sweat the small stuff. 
Um, I read tape op a lot. I actually had an, uh, one, like letter to tape op that got featured and I wrote it cause I, there was a, someone had like made this whole article about, um, like measuring like the snare to the overheads and, uh, the person in the article who like responded and they were like, well, you know, like the, all the measuring tapes in the world, like don't mount up to like a, a hill of beans. And I wrote in, I was like, I love that. I totally agree with that. I don't think you should do that. And, and my point being is I think that, uh, like worrying about the, the little things and trying to worry about like how far your, your room mics are from your drums and like, you know, like, is this, you know, plus two dB or plus one dB? Like all that stuff doesn't matter. And I think just being. What about plus 1.5 dB? Only on Christmas. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, just being, being flexible with what's in front of you and just being adaptable and ready to jump in and. Just t- removing yourself from the process, I think, is like so. so don't sweat the best. small stuff. So we're gonna we're gonna roll with DS the SS. Yes, so that's that's my new. I like that DS the SS. DS the SS, dude. All right. So, um, how about a favorite hardware tool or something physical that you've been excited about using recently? Just one. Uh, it's hard for me to pick because I'm super happy with like my laptop and my like UA Apollo. But like my favorite piece of gear, are barefoot speakers. There's just something about working on them that allows you to create quickly. I trust what I hear. I don't second guess it. Are these the big ones with the subwoofer kicking on the I'll side? I'll take any of them. I like the micro mains. I like the, um, that are just like the single drivers. I like the ones that are like the bigger, the 35s that have the side drivers. They all sound really good. And I feel like every time I work on tracks and take them home, I'm like, oh, this sounds just like what I was doing. It's almost done. I love that. Do um, those guys have so built in um, limiting and compression? I think they have some version of that in it. And do you ever run into that when you're mixing where you have to listen to, a, like, if you crank it up, are you being fooled by some limiting or compression? Oh, mode? yeah. I don't know the answer to that directly. Um, there's probably some signal processing happening in those things. Um, probably in all all active probably in all active some, stuff some but if you're, if you're hearing compression a good job be able to hear compression is <laughs> great so pat yourself on the back but be also like uh you know i think that just comes down to like maybe the listening situation's fucked up maybe the room's fucked up and you need to go check it somewhere else right. anyways no worries no worries yeah. i just i don't know that question just popped into my head so no yeah. not a lot i will say they're, they're ultra revealing and Yes, you can get away with more volume on them uh, and kind of like not be fatigued by it and miss some compression elements. But at the same time, like uh, you really hear everything like full spectrum and not be like annoyed by them. That's the hard thing about speakers, like getting them to sound good, but like you can listen to them for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, my trick is turn it down. Yep, turn it down. Um, all right, how about a favorite software tool, something you're excited about? Man, I love... Uh, I love Ableton and Pro Tools together. That, that's like a standard answer. But I like all these like um, these like rental and subscription plugins right now, like Splice and the Slate stuff. I think they're such great tools. And um, with the Slate stuff, um, you you know you pay fifteen bucks a month. Then you can just buy it. But you know I pay fifteen bucks a month, and then every time they add one, I get it, and I, I love that. And it's really um, you using them a lot. I use them a lot. Um, when I upgraded to Pro Tools 12, you know, I lost all my plugins and it was like, it's really frustrating. And I kind of like went through like, am I going to buy all this wave stuff again? And you Right. Know, you probably went from 10 to 12 and, and yeah, uh, I just missed lost your R tests. Yeah. Lost all that stuff. And which is fine because it's actually, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier, it was like a refresh. Like I don't have all these waves plugins anymore. So I don't use them. I don't use CLA 2A on my stuff anymore. You know, I'm using the Fab Filter stuff. Turns more. out we don't really need a thousand plugins to make a great record. <laughs> it turns out, yeah. Um, but I will say when you do need a thousand plugins, the slate stuff is great. Cause you can have, you know, one plug and then has three or four things in it. And I, I love that. I love you like stacking, di- you know, different compressors and EQs. And, um, it's a little bit of a CPU hog, but I love that. And, uh, Psh, to DS the SS dude. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about the small stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, like just uh, splice the rent to own, uh, I'm, I'm renting to own vocal synth two right now, which is great. So uh, that's part of splice. Yeah. I'm not using splice. Is splice only something that I want to look at if I'm doing hip hop production or is it something I'm going to be using with rock and roll and songwriter stuff and all kinds That's of That's a cool great things. question. I think that splice definitely emerged from like modern, like modern production is so dictated by hip hop and pop right now, but a lot of that flexibility leans really easily into every other style. So splice is like a platform for not only like accessing like sounds and plugins and libraries, but sharing files back and forth. Um, like you and I can share a pro tool session and if you upload it, like, and we're, and we're sharing it, and you do some fixes today, I don't have to re-download your whole session again. I just get the files that you updated. So it's really mm. quick and easy. I'm, okay, cool. A lot of us are always like transferring the whole thing back and forth every time. And Splice kind of eliminates that. But they added this whole like rental 
plug-in rental thing. Uh, you know, um, I don't know when. I just kind of recently discovered they were doing it, and I was like, yes, awesome. Because that's cool. So, know, so yeah. splice sort of membership kind of thing. You can get sounds for loops and drum beats and things like that. And but you can also too. get plugins and install them into Pro Tools and and use them and get a rented license agreement, mm -hmm. kind of like a um, like Slate. Right. Uh, but also, it's this collaborative space where you can share your your sessions back and forth. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. I like that. I like yeah. that sounds like something that's trying to solve a variety of problems. Yeah. And that's a good example. Making. If you can tell, like they found other problems they could solve while they were doing it. You know, they, they, they saw that if they, you know, there are this platform, all these artists are coming to with their sessions and like transferring them back and forth. Like what else do these people need? You know, um, buying plugins is, is expensive and like, I'm super scarred from buying stuff that goes out of date. And I mm. think everyone is. And so yeah. like they saw an opening for that and you know, it's good. All right, so now um, we've talked about some of the business stuff already. Um, how about an organizational tip, online resource, or just advice for keeping all your shit together? Mm -hmm. Man, Google Drive, Google Drive, I love it. I, uh, Zoo Labs, like the, this entire organization that you know, and many others that I know are just the run of Google Drive. Um, I just think it's great for all of the emailing, the calendar, the storage is pretty cheap. Um, you know, maybe less, less known people, you know, use uh, Trello. I love Trello, which is like a giant to-do list. Um, for me, like I always have a new idea in my head and that's been like a place for me to like be actionable about my ideas. Like I can keep track of all of them from crazy ideas for businesses to people I meet to, you know, song ideas. And then actual, like, what am I working on right now? What am I doing? What, what's coming down the pipe? What do I got to you know, I can, I can separate that for like, you know, all the different parts of my life. Um, like I even have one now for like my wife and I have like one for like everything we're trying to do, like, you know, save for the house, you know, right. get this vacation together or whatever. Um, so Trello is, is a big part of that. Um, uh, I was trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I would, I would just say like, like, um, like podcasts are actually really helpful. I think like, like, you know, recording studio rock stars for sure. Uh, just listening to other people, um, that seems to help me organize my my mental space a lot better. Like, oh, they do that. I do that. Okay, I can stop worrying about that. That's so. cool, man. All right, uh, and thanks for uh, the shout out about the podcast too. All right, so let's take his last question is hypothetical. We'll go take the uh, way back studio machine. You can go back in time, find young Brad. Um, rocking out with your, with your vans, your laces untied and your vans. No, man, skateboarding slip, slip on, slip, slip on, on, sorry. Slip uh, on. horrible skateboarder. Uh, I had a black, black hoodie and a, and a wallet chain and a super short haircut that my grandma gave me. Nice, man. And, uh, you're going to go back and give yourself one bit of advice. You say, listen, young skate skater boy. Um, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself? embrace being adaptable. I started out that way. And then I spent a long time trying to pick a lane. And for me, I don't have one lane, you know, this, this vehicle is uh, double wide, you know? So I think just embracing those things has been really important. And um, like, I, I am a producer engineer, like, and even those two words have different meanings, like, you know, producer in the sense of like, I build tracks and chop vocals, but also producer like Rick Rubin sit in and just guide guide the vibe of the, of the studio and the song and get the song to come out of the artist and not touch any knobs. Um, and then, you know, engineer, like not being afraid for that to mean like, you know, driving like the analog boat or like just tuning vocals, like, and just, so embracing all of it as to always be available and ready for the opportunity and uh, yeah, not be afraid of being adaptable. Sweet. Well, Rock stars, thank you for listening. And uh, let's, we can embrace the ending of this wonderful podcast episode. Um, mm -hmm. Brad, let the rock stars know how they can find you online. How do they go, go and follow you and learn more about you and your music? Yeah, uh, braddollar.com, B R A D D O L L A R.com is a great central place. Um, I post a lot of great stuff on Instagram. Um, I've re started coming back to it this last, uh, last year and and I've been posting session photos from my entire career. Um, there's some really great shots in it. So um, you can follow me at Brad K Dollar, B-R-A-D, the letter K, D-O-L-L-A-R. Instagram, pretty much exclusively. Um, I haven't been on Facebook for years and uh, Twitter, I don't really manage. Um, so that, and then um, anybody who actually wants to talk about making music with me or actually wants to like have a conversation, uh, you can email me directly at producedbybraddollar at gmail.com. All that stuff's online. But um, if anybody's listening is like, oh, I, yeah, I want to ask him this, like you can just reach straight out to me. I'm, I'm really available. 
uh, online. I may not get back to you right away, but I, I did get it and I will get back to you. Um, I, I really value everyone uh, who reaches out and, and, you know, wants to talk more about this, this music ecosystem. I think that this podcast, all the conversations we have out in the world, like they, they're all moving the paradigm forward. So I'm super grateful for what you do, Liz, and, uh, and, you know, all of your efforts in this music community in Nashville and abroad. So, um, yeah, anyone who wants to do the same thing, reach out. Cause that's what I'm into. Nice, man. Thanks, dude. Well, uh, Rockstar, as a reminder, you can find links to stuff we're talking about in the show notes. Um, we'll have uh, his website link in there as well. And um, the YouTube playlist where you can go check out the records stuff with, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember if there was GZ in there, Bob Weir, Slightly Stupid, um, and a bunch of other cool cool sessions that you've done, as well as some of the info about Zoo Labs too. Yeah, so zoolabs.org. Zoolabs.org. And um, then you'll also find a link to the Mix Master Bundle in there, too. So if you want to go check that out and get some mix training, go do it. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks, Brad. Thank we'll you see much. you around Nashville, man. Thanks. See you soon. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music